We are your home theater and AV questions answered. This is AV Rant. Want your home theater or AV question answered by Tom and Rob? Send it to question at avrant.com. Welcome to another edition of AV Rant. I'm Tom Andre, and I'm here with... Rob H. This is AV Rant. It's your home theater and AV questions answered. And uh, yeah, we'll, we'll mention uh, this week again that uh, we have a, a crossover event happening. A three podcast, six man mega podcast event coming up for Thanksgiving. Um, we need a moderator. Ah. We need somebody who can mute the other people so we won't talk on top, on top of each other. <laughs> well, I, I think that should be a thing that every that should be done in all multiple person right, talking events. Right. I I don't know if we want to try and schedule a seventh person considering we don't even have an agreement uh, on six of us yet. I think um, we should ask Liz to do it. That's true. Yeah, I'd be down for that. By all means, reach out. I will. Okay. I will. I will almost certainly not do that. Okay. But I will. I think it's a great idea. But I will, <laughs> and Liz, if you, she's never going to hear this. But Liz, if you do hear this, it would be. I, awesome. I, would, I think. I think it would have been a great idea. It would. Had I had any energy whatsoever to make it a mm. thing that happened. Uh, but yes, uh, that's an uh, event between uh, us, AV Rant, of course, uh, the HT guys, Ara and Brayden from the HDTV and Home Theater Podcast, and uh, DJ from the Bright Side Home Theater, and uh, Lee Overstreet from AV Rant as well. That's how we get six people going on that. Um, so last week, uh, I mentioned how uh, we're going to be answering one question from each podcast. Well, people responded uh, big time. We got uh, quite a few sent into AV Rant, so I'm not even going to like really request that people send any more in because we're only going to be done. picking one so uh um, floodgates are closed well Sorry, done guys. Uh, amazing response i'm like man our <laughs> our listeners really come through so that was really awesome to see that response people definitely saying they're looking forward to it and uh yeah that'll that'll get recorded Good. at some point and posted across all three podcasts on thanksgiving so quick update on the kitchen not that anybody cares but <laughs> <laughs> so, it is what's going on in tom's life this is what's going on in my life. So today was the big day. Today was the day that the granite got installed. What does that mean? That means that today I get granite and tomorrow I get a sink. Nice. And more importantly than the sink, I get a dishwasher, Rob. I have been mm. hand washing dishes in a bathroom mm -hmm. sink mm. for Real off fun. and on months. With months. The smaller basin the and air... the lower faucet. Always fun the to wash Airbnb dishes. Airbnb that. that we had uh, had, a, had a, a kitchen with a a dishwasher that didn't get anything clean mm. so we ended up hand washing everything and it, the kitchen was barely bigger than most well it's bigger than my master bathroom because my bathroom mm -hmm. master bathroom is tiny but i've seen master bathrooms that were at least double or triple the size <laughs> and i'm not talking about ridiculous houses i'm talking about normal you know stock you know not a gated community but you know planned community sure. master bathrooms that i was like this is ridiculously large you should put the bed in here so this is uh the, this kitchen with the kitchen we were in was a quarter of that size mm -hmm. so unfortunately as things uh, tend to go uh, in my life uh, in general and in in well specifically and in placing of uh you know real stone rather than engineered stone in a a kitchen the things didn't line up quite right mm -hmm. and uh it was to the point where the guys who were installing it were going, we got an issue. Mm. I'm like, well, that's not what I wanted to hear. Mm -hmm. So they installed all the granite, except the granite that t gets anywhere near a sink or a dishwasher. I see. And since granite's going in first, I'm assuming this is not an under-counter sink. It must be an over-counter sink. It is an under-counter sink, It's yes. an under-counter sink. Under, under so yeah. How it's is a, it's a, it's a, sink after granite, then? Sink, sink is after granite, because they mount the granite, and then they, they center the sink underneath it. Oh, Okay. So I did not. Hey, you, you, if you've uh, got a problem with that order, feel free to take them up with them because I don't know. I'm not the expert here. All I know is they were like they had to call in their big boss, and ah. the big boss came in and said, "This is gonna if if we're gonna have to fix this one part, which it was a part that was wrong mm -hmm. at the shop, then we might as well fix it all at the shop." So sure. they took a bunch of me more measurements and took a bunch of notes and hauled it all away. And they're like, "We'll get back to you." <laughs> I'm like, you're going to make my wife cry, and then I'm going to cry, mm. <laughs> and my children are going to cry, and you're a terrible person. I hope you feel bad about yourself right now. So I don't – everything is now 
on hold and pushed back and everything else. So we were all expecting to have a kitchen tomorrow right. that we can actually use, but we cannot do that. So All right. Well, maybe by the time people are actually hearing the audio version of this podcast, it'll it'll be the case, maybe, end of no. the week? No. Okay. There's zero chance. They took it back at the end of the day. If they work on it tomorrow, it'd be a shock. Mm. And then the earliest they would ever come back is Friday. Okay. And then I would still not... Ha- I still have to wait another day for somebody else to come and do all the mount the the installing of everything because that's a different group of people they don't actually do that they just do the granite so yeah fun it's stupid it's all stupid it's <laughs> it feels so petty and all of you people who have been stuck in your house for seven eight however many months mm-hmm. it is now and have been like oh i just want to get out of my house i just want to get into my house yeah. can i please can Thank i please be in a house that functions properly <laughs> without leaks or yeah. me having to do dishes in a bucket which we did for months and months for, yeah. <laughs> for a long time so, you know, it's one of this. Uh, anything exciting going on with you, Rob? Uh, let me think here. Uh, my parents are having massive Wi-Fi problems, so I'm trying to sort that out, but we'll, we'll get it done. Just try turning it off and turning it back on again. That my wife totally did, did that to somebody at work today. She was, she was on the phone with this guy, and he's I, I'm like, I'm working on a different computer, and uh, her her email is connected to that computer. It's mm-hmm. like one of our desktops, and it's just these messages come, keep popping up from the sky. I can't log on. There's no link. The link doesn't work. What's going on? And my wife's like, I see the response back. Did you try turning it off and turning it back yep. off again? I'm like, burn, yep. baby. That, that's old school 90s face action. That's right. Face. Mm. You got faced. I said it to my kids one time. They looked at me like, what? What does that even hey, mean? I'm like, everything old is new again. I do not know what that means. But... <laughs> Everyone in my generation knows what it knows yep. what it implies. Yep. And you just got it. Bad. <laughs> Anyways, this is gonna be the yawn cast because I'm exhausted. All right. My I had a doc I had a, my son had a doctor's appointment for a well visit and a flu shot. He got four shots. He's eleven years old mm-hmm. and he's a super dramatic kid. Ah. So he got it. and then he was Mr. Roboto for the rest of the day because he wouldn't move his shoulders. <laughs> he's just walking around and <laughs> We're sitting there, and my wife bought uh, bagels for the for the morning, and she's like, "Do you want your bagel?" And he said, "Yes." So she handed it to me, and I I handed it towards to, to him, and then I moved it a little bit further away, so we had to extend his arm. Nice. And my wife's like, <laughs> she just walked away. She's like, "You're the worst," and then she was cracking up in the corner. I'm like, "I am the worst. Thank you. I try." All right, this is AV Rant, the podcast that answers your home theater and AV questions. To get your questions answered, all you have to do is ask. You ask by emailing us at question at avrant.com. You can also go to avrant.com, leave us a comment there, facebook.com slash avrantpodcast, youtube.com slash avrant. Uh, face, uh, I said Facebook already. Mm-hmm. Uh, Rob, you can reach him at uh, rob at avrant.com. His Twitter's at first reflect. I'm Tom at avrant.com. My Twitter's at avrant underscore Tom. I want to thank our listeners of the week to become a listener of the week. You support the podcast in some way. If you want to do that financially, there's two possible ways to do that. The first is going to avrent.com. Click, click on that Buy Us a Cup of Coffee link, which is on the right side of the page. Rob doesn't actually drink coffee, so you're just buying one for That's me. That's right. Which is fine. Totally fine. fine. How do you not drink? You drink diet soda or something, right? I do. You drink some sort of caffeine, oh, right? Oh, yeah. I, yeah. I drink okay. uh, cola, which is, which is probably okay. worse for me than, than coffee, but... It's, I, it's a taste I feel like thing. there's a lot of carcinogens in coffee. I just feel like I'm drinking it. And I'm going, man, this just, just doesn't feel good for you. Like ca- at least ca- at least Coca Cola, you get bubbles and water, and you kind of like, well, this might not be so bad until you get into like the zero calorie stuff, and you're like, this is problem. I'm surprised I haven't grown another arm yet. But co- coffee, I love coffee. I love the smell of coffee. I love the smell of roasting coffee. I drink coffee. I go, ooh. <laughs> Shouldn't be drinking this. <laughs> like, I like I go, the smell. I, go, I just <laughs> never caught into the taste. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, so buy us a cup of coffee link that sends you to a PayPal donation site uh, where you can use your PayPal or your credit card to send money directly to us. So I want to thank Brandon for doing that this month. Thank you very much, Brandon. For sure, Brandon. Thank you so much for that PayPal donation. Really appreciate it. So if you want to support us in an ongoing way and don't want to have to remember to go to our website every month and click on that pe- that coffee cup, which I so painstakingly worked for, mm-hmm. worked on on my limited Photoshop skills, you could go to patreon.com slash podcast where you could sign up to be one of our patrons. A patron's a person who every month they take some money away from you and give it to us. 
ongoing yep. for the rest of your life, hopefully, <laughs> at least for uh, more than one month. And that's uh, just a minimum of a dollar, maximum of infinity dollars. So we're going to take our 123 patrons over at patreon.com. Kevin is one of our patrons. He mentioned that uh, so far he loves his Epson 5050 UB and Screen Innovations Black Diamond screen. Uh, even though that was that particular screen was not our talk recommendation, uh, only because I think it's more expensive. It right? is. Is that right? It, it is, is more fun. expensive. is isn't perfect, so he wants to send a full follow-up later. He shared some comments about the uh, 2019 NVIDIA Shield Tube versus the Pro that we will get to in the questions later on. But he sent some. Uh, if you're on YouTube, you'll see some pictures of his setup. It's very nice mm -hmm. setup. Uh, that's a behind-the-screen light, I guess, is what's happening yeah, there. Yeah. Yeah, that's built built something. into the frame, so it's kind of like a bias light, basically. Yeah. Hmm? Yeah. That kid looks really 3D, man. That's a pretty good image. <laughs> it's not bad. <laughs> so thank you very much to our 20, 123 patrons and Kevin, Indeed. including Kevin. Indeed. Patreon.com slash Podcast for anybody who'd like to sign up for an automatic monthly donation. Thanks so much to our 123 patrons over there. Kevin, thank you for being one of them and glad that you're enjoying your new projector and screen. So we got some notes of gratitude uh, for keeping the podcast going during these trying times. Well, during any times, really. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> okay. true enough. It's uh, yeah, this. It, 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 I was just telling my wife, I'm like, you know, people just think it's, and if for me, for the most part, it is just sitting around talking to a friend <laughs> while doing a podcast. Rob does a ton of work <laughs> behind the scenes to make this thing happen, which of which I'm infinitely grateful. But uh, yeah. It's still, it's still work, even for me, and and I'm I'm trying to do the bare minimum, and I'm I'm still like, oh, I can't do the podcast tonight. I, I was asleep like an hour yep. ago. I fell asleep watching Drink Dragon Ball with my kids. I was like, can't keep eyes open, must close eyes. I'm very old. So we thank you for thanking us. Uh, so Kevin, Daz, Mark. Mark says uh, we make Fridays fly by, which is nice when you're at work and fo forced to interact with the public. Mm -hmm. I don't know what job he has where he's listening to us and interacting with the public at the same time. And does the public hear us talking? Or do they say, <laughs> what are you listening to? <laughs> it would just sound like babbling voices, even if you're I using so. AirPods and everybody can hear what you're listening to. And Dan, who says he's a recent disciple uh to our rantings here mm -hmm. and jack who's been listening since episode 400 which i think we're on like 700 723 right? we're up to now yeah all right zakir nathan and jason so thank you all of you as well yeah i'll repeat the names kevin daz mark dan jack zakir nathan and jason thank you all very much for those notes of gratitude and encouragement it is very much appreciated these days it is. and yes. uh and we certainly want to say thank you to everybody who continues to listen continues to send in your questions like i say the response we got for that upcoming thanksgiving episode i was kind of blown away by that because it was like right away and good questions and we're only going to cho choose one i'm like ah wow that's that's more than i expected and that was remarkable so so am i going to get some sort of like short list here yeah it's, it's that... on the shared dog oh is it I put them in there except for one uh... one of them was longer and i haven't put it up there yet all right, I haven't seen it. In fact, I, I think I've Doc has disappeared off of I have to. Yeah, it should be in there again. somewhere. All I right. can send you the link again. I know. That's fine. All right. So in the news this week, uh, bad news, everyone. Mm -hmm. Several of our listeners, Bob, Nathan, Jack, saw a report that was first published by a German audio website that seems to have discovered a potentially unfixable bug in the HDMI 2.1 HD. I think I said T. Could be. HDMI 2.1 chipsets used by Denon Morantz and Yamaha. In this year's AV receivers mm -hmm. and the Yamaha. Uh, yep. Because they're the ones that had the most of them. <laughs> Those were the ones we were recommending. I was I like, know. ha, I just saw Denon and Morantz was the end of the line. I saw the and I thought, oh, it's going to be Anki or something. But it mm -hmm. wasn't. Now we're in trouble. These HDMI 2.1 chipsets were made by Panasonic. And if you tried to use them to pass through 4K 120 with VRR, uh, variable refresh rate, and HDR, which is a uh, high dynamic <laughs> range. <laughs> God, my brain. Catch up, Tom. You know what I need? Coffee. Too many initialisms. That's the problem. So if you try to do a uh, variable refresh rate and uh, high dynamic range from an Xbox Series X or an NVIDIA 30 Series graphics card, it does not work. Black screen. PS PS5 has not been tested yet because it's not out. No, nope, but some of the, uh, the early influencers and reviewers have received test units, so. How come I'm not an early influencer or reviewer? I ordered my Pixel 5 like a long time ago. I feel like I should have gotten it by now, but I have not. Apparently, I do not have the influence. We are not that I influencers think I with do. our 400 views on our videos. Woo! -hoo! 
400 views, man. That's a lot of views. It actually is, because those are like legitimate in our case. <laughs> yeah, I know. Nobody nobody sticks around for two hours accidentally. <laughs> like uh, the, the, the YouTube algorithm doesn't like, hey, you are watching this Let's Play of whatever. You'd like two and a half hours of two dudes bad lip sync yep. talking about AV. That's us. That's us. Making the content that you need. Mm -hmm. Okay. The claim is is uh, the claim that is making some people panic is that this all has to do with the fixed rate link, which F L F R L fixed rate link. I'm never going to be able to say that right. That is used uh, for some of these very high bandwidth signals and how that cannot be updated via firmware. For their part, you know, Sound United responded to Audioholics inquiries and said that they are aware of the issue and they're working on a permanent solution, which is send your receiver back and we'll fix Maybe. it. And once they, and once they have one, it will be offered to any and all customers who have bought a 2020 Denon or Marantz receiver pre-pro. Yamaha has not given a similar statement yet, but at the same time, they've never promised HDMI 2.1 support out of the box. They've always said those features will be unlocked with a future, future firmware update. Please keep watch over Emotiva's website for <laughs> news on that. We don't know whether this can be fixed via firmware patch or not, but over at HDTV Test, Vincent Teo has detailed how Sony and LG both ran into somewhat similar issues with their TVs, and they have implemented an imperfect but functional solution. We'll have a link to yeah, that. He's got a couple of videos. Notes. Vincent Teo has a couple of videos that mention what's going on on the television side. So I am putting some pieces together because I suspect that mm. this this might be the case, which would actually kind of be good news if it is. But it's speculation okay. from here on. Bad news, good news. So you hit you with the bad news first. So in the, in the nutshell, for those of you who are like, oh, please tell me more and not get on to my question. In a nutshell, the EDID, the Extended Display Identification Data of any HDMI sync device only has so many characters like a tweet. Mm -hmm. And if you try to turn on every HDMI 2.1 feature at the same time, you run out of character <laughs> spaces. And then you have to have that the one slash two thing at the end and it doesn't understand that. Nope. So what LG and Sony have done in in their TVs is they deactivate Dolby Vision if you select that you want 4K 120 with VRR, variable refresh rate. Apparently, Dolby Vision takes up a lot of characters because Dolby. Yep. So like, I mean, we have, you know, seven God. different profiles of Dolby Vision. Don't you want to say Princess. that you support each of them individually? <laughs> Dolby's like, I'm sorry. I need a lot of characters. Yep. Excuse me. This is Dolby. <laughs> I'm not like DTS. I'm, I'm not just boosting the bass over here. So okay, he was sorry. like, how do, how do we fix this? I don't know why Dolby talks Turn like that. In my mind, that's how Dolby sounds. That's what they sound like. Uh, apparently, Dolby Vision takes up a lot of characters in the EDID. Denon and Marantz receivers do not provide this option. They definitely support Dolby Vision, so could that be a potential fix? For the time being, Sound United is saying that uh, the only workarounds are to plug your 4K 120 gaming sources directly into your TV and then use eARC, or set your games to output 4K 60, or set your games to output 4K 120, but at an 8-bit instead of 10-bit and with no HDR. Aviorant listener Nathan asks, what's the point of, HD, of, the, of the HDMI form and the HDMI LLC if products are going to come out with a new spec and still not function together? And if this does all boil down to an EDID issue, could folks over at HD Fury potentially create a solution? <laughs> I, I mean, I don't see how they, they would be able to create a solution because you would still end up running out of characters yep. at one side of this thing or another. So uh, how, how does this happen? Dude, these things are complex. <laughs> you know, these, you know, you would think that everything would be tested and everything would, it just, things happen. I mean, when, you know, mistakes when they created the original HDMI specs, uh, they just didn't foresee this many features being added in the future. Uh, and so they didn't create an EDID that had enough characters. Now, could we envision uh, an HDMI 3.0 spec that has more characters available in the, in the EDID? Yep, yep, that seems entirely possible. It would mean that all devices right. in the chain have to support it, that type of thing. Maybe there could be a embedded backwards compatible version with fewer characters to work with older devices, but this might be one reason why it is HDMI 2.1 and not HDMI 3.0. When you're like, this is a lot of features added over 2.0, why did they only tick the number up to 2.1 was because a lot of the underlying foundation of the communication between devices right. has remained the same. Um, so, you know, why do we have an HDMI forum and HDMI licensing? 
and still end up with problems. Uh, well, I mean, a lot of it is racing. Emotiva, you know, as much as we rag on them, uh, they tried to do everything. What? They tried to do everything by the I book. Rag on them? They, they tried to do it uh, exactly right. according to spec. And they're like, every TV and source device out there, the manufacturers have taken shortcuts and, and done things outside of spec to make things function, but now it's outside of spec. And us following spec means that things don't work together. So it's not just that you know you've got a, a forum and a licensing body it's that companies don't follow it and they race to get things out there right. so i can't that's the biggest yeah. thing is people try, them pushing hdmi 2.1 everybody's like i gotta get you know who's gonna have the first receiver or first tv or the first right. you know whatever with hdmi 2.1 and they're like just make the chip make the chip make yeah. the chip and they're like yeah it's, it's it's done we think it's done it's pretty it's done it's mostly done so like and they you send know it out could there, hd it. fury potentially come out with a device that has some kind of or work around I could see it because maybe like for example in the current EDID uh, like all of the supported resolutions have to be listed that takes up characters in the EDID right. and HD Fury could just go you know what we know that you really only care about 1080p and up we could just like erase the characters that are being used for all the lower resolutions you can't do that with improper spec but for a hack like HD Fury you could potentially right. do something like that um, you know does this matter a lot that Dolby Vision disappears on your Sony or LG TV if you want to activate 4K 120 with uh, variable refresh rate and HDR. Well, the Xbox Series X is supposed to sp support Dolby Vision in games. This means that on those TVs, you can't have all of those things. You can't have 4K 120 variable refresh rate and Dolby Vision. You'd have to like knock that down to HDR 10 or limit the games to 4K 60 with variable refresh rate and Dolby Vision. It's a choice. In Sony, that choice is explicit. You can actually choose you know, is 4K 120 supported or is Dolby Vision supported? It's one or the other. Uh, but the reason why I think that might be a solution for Den and Marantz and Yamaha is because as Vincent Tio showed in his uh, videos, in the Sony TVs and in the LG TVs, when you activate Dolby Vision, it shows that the fixed rate link part of the EDID gets turned off. And that seems to be exactly what's going on in these tests that were done by the German website. They're like, the fixed rate link doesn't work, but we know that the AV receivers have Dolby Vision activated. Um, and mm -hmm. so on the Sony, if you choose 4K 120 and it turns Dolby Vision off, then the fixed rate link turns on and Dolby Vision turns off. So I'm like, if, they, if Sony was able to implement that via firmware and LG was able to implement that via firmware, it doesn't seem completely out of the realm of possibility that Denim Marantz and Yamaha might be able to. So... Uh, yeah, that's the hope. But uh, Den and Emirates are committed to having a solution if it actually involves uh, having to send it in and swap out a physical board at some point in the future. They're committed to doing that. Uh, but day one, when your Xbox Series X or your PlayStation 5 arrives, uh, don't don't count on passing it through your one input that you had anyway. <laughs> so like we said in... It's a good year it's to wait. It's a very, to buy a receiver. very good year to wait on buying a receiver. <laughs> yes. We were hoping that the Yamaha was the solution, but now maybe the Yamaha is not even the no. solution. So, sorry, guys. All you looking for receivers out there. And, and all you receiver manufacturers are like, hey, Dave, your rent guys don't really... Well, we don't really care about them anyways. Okay, good. All right, Mini DSP has introduced two new measurement microphone options. The $195 UMic 2 offers a larger microphone capsule than the Mic 1, UMic 1, with a lower noise floor, lower distortion, and built-in support for 32-bit 192 kilohertz signals. It will start shipping in November. Uh, are we, do we know if Herb is going to be working with us? I don't know I yet. So. It we should seems uh, reasonable. reach out and find out. Yeah, if Herb's going to be working at Cross Spectrums Labs is a friend of the podcast. Herb over there has been uh, sending out uh, customized uh, correction curves for UMic ones for mm -hmm. years and years and years for a nominal increase in price over the price of the actual microphone. It's just an amazing deal. So we're hoping that he'll be doing that for the UMic too. We'll find out. Uh, he's, there's also the 550 to 750 UMic X. Comes as either an 8 or 16 microphone array for taking simultaneous multi, multiple mic measurements. The price also includes a license for Rumi Q Wizard Pro, which is normally $100 on its own, which is a, with, uh, which is necessary for measuring all those mics at the same time. The price on the UMic 1 has also gone down to $75. So at the very least, you can still get, hopefully, UMic 1s That's from right. Herb. Yeah. 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 I don't even know, generally speaking, if you need more than a U mic. You really don't. For for what? 
you're doing in the yeah, home theater. You really so, don't. Yeah. Uh, for those of you that weren't listening to the news, I mean, I don't understand how this was such a big deal. But anyways, Quibi is dead. Yep. I didn't know Quibi was a thing. I think I remember talking about it the once. The quick bites lasted for about six months. They were quick indeed. They were. So quick. It's the quickest. They should be proud of themselves. They really stuck to their guns. <laughs> and they said, you know what? We're going to live up to our name. We're not going to make it. So it completely closed down on December 1st. Of the $1.75 billion they raised from investors, they have about $350 million left, which will be returned to those investors. <laughs> Good luck. And they're trying to sell off the content they made, but reportedly Apple, Warner, Facebook, and NBC Universal have all turned them down already. The website is still alive, and you can still sign up for a 14-day free trial. It might not be the only way to ever watch the Golden Arm. That was like the one thing that got some buzz uh it's no, uh no, no. what is her Sorry. name rachel brosnahan the woman from uh the marvelous miss Maisel, um emmy oh. winning actor um, yeah she's the thing yeah she's she's watchable so she was she's in something called the gold, the golden arm the golden arm is not a martial arts quick thing. bites it's called not... the golden arm where apparently she has a golden arm and it's like slowly killing her and she refuses to give up her golden arm and that is the entire show in six minutes at a time I already hate yeah. it. I never have never seen Everybody it. Everybody does, but awful. everyone was like, this is so bad. You have to see it. Quibi. Oh. Oh. <laughs> yeah. You know, I just, I mean, I, I, I've got, so one of my friends who's been quarantined in, in his house for most of the, these seven months, he, the, his office opened up for a couple of months and let people go back in until too many people started doing it and they shut it back down. Then they said, why are we paying for all this office space when mm -hmm. everybody's working from home? So they're not renewing their lease. <laughs> they're just not going to have office space. I'm like, well, you're a tech company. I don't see why not. Anyways, that dude's way into TikTok. And I get oh, yeah. TikTok links like constantly. And I'm like, I'm, I mean, they're all right. Some of them are funny or whatever, but that's just, I'm, I'm a little bit more a long form guy myself. I need something a little bit more long form. That being said, I just watched uh, The Lighthouse, which is mm -hmm. a pretty critically acclaimed horror movie i yeah. guess in the lovecraftian uh tradition i watched at the end of that thing i said what the heck did i just see and why <laughs> did i watch sit here and watch the whole thing uh but it was interesting so i guess if you want to waste an hour and a half of your life they can do that because from the comments here daz wanted to share some updates first he received and replaced his ascend cmt 340 se tweeters that had blown the speakers have come back to life He's decided to, number two, he's decided to get the Emotiva XBA3 amplifier. He wanted the ampli anyway, and it should provide some peace of mind, but he'll wait for Black Friday prices. I thought that Emotiva doesn't do sales anymore. Was Supposedly, that Emo, but they still have... Did not do sales yeah, anymore. Yeah, they say they don't do sales anymore, but they still have, like, uh, refreshed products that sell for less sometimes, so... That's not a sale? I feel like that's a sale. Semantics. Anyways. Number three, after we discussed how music is not mastered to movie reference level, he decided to carefully watch his SPL meter while playing the Funk Essentials playlist on Apple Music. Okay. He found the average SPL hit at 85 dB with his master volume at negative 9. But on one song, it immediately jumped up to 95 dB. So since his tweeters blew when he had the master volume at 0 dB, it does seem possible that a song might have peaked well over 105. Uh, that was eye-opening. Now he knows to be a bit more careful. And dude, seriously, turn it down. Yep, That's loud. loud. <laughs> That's real loud. His wife, Dre, Drea. had a good laugh at my... <laughs> Drea, sorry. Sorry, Drea. <laughs> he, She's a doctor. He even said that, uh, that Drea was correct. So we know. We know. <laughs> doctor Drea. That's right. She better be a doctor. If she's not a doctor, you should call her that anyways. Anyways, Drea had a good laugh at my take on interior designers. For her taste, she either wants speakers in the living room that are compact and discreet, SVS Prime Wireless are definitely under consideration, or big, bold statement pieces. She'd like the look of the Focal Scala. Scala? Scala. Scala? Utopia Evo. Nothing in between. <laughs> yeah. You. Tell you, tell you what, you can, Dre, Drea, you just, you shouldn't have said that. <laughs> you, could, you just opened a big old can of worms. Dude, you got to start looking at, like, uh, 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 dollies mm -hmm. like some of their finishes on some of their speakers was just amazing or even the you know which ones I really used to love was the uh, the Ascend Sierra whatever it was in the bamboo oh yeah oh my god that's such a sexy speaker it's so nice it. 
But whatever. Go get something expensive, dude. She said that was okay. RD wanted to recommend the Channels app with its Channels Plus DVR service. $8 a month. It's available for Apple, Android, and Fire TV. He wanted a solution for watching local sports broadcasts without paying for cable or any of the live TV streaming services, which are all nearly as expensive as cable now. He got an over-the-air antenna and an HD Home Run HD TV tuner. Those along with uh, the Channels app are not only way cheaper, but also look and sound much better, so he highly recommends them. That's good. Mm, yeah, I like that recommendation. Yeah, that's good. That's not bad. $8 a month not yeah. too bad. So Bob in the Philippines. Hey, there's Bob. I haven't heard from him in a hot minute. Reluctantly, hey, Bob, I take offense yeah, to this. Not, not took our advice. For what he was anticipating. <laughs> reluctantly took our advice and called the LG Philippines corporate office to inquire about the power board replacement message that keeps popping up in his OLED every time he turns it on. Bob figured he'd have to send this TV away. But to his pleasant surprise, LG confirmed that his TV serial number, uh, f- via his TV uh, serial number, that his power board should definitely be replaced. And they said their tech department would contact him to schedule a date where they would come to his house and do the power board replacement on site. Dude, don't believe them. They're going to come there and they're going to like, oh, that doesn't exactly measure up. We have to take the whole thing back to the to the and shave it down again. You'll see. We'll see. Anyways, they called the very next day and scheduled a technician for the coming Monday, Monday morning. The technician called and said he would arrive at 1030. Everything seemed to be going much better than expected. Then two of the uh, technicians did eventually show up at 2.45 p.m., but there weren't directly from LG. Bob quickly discovered they were some kind of some kind of subcontractors from a local repair shop so Bob asked them if they had ever performed the service on the LG OLED before and they both nodded so he let them get to work once the OLED was unmounted from the wall from the wall they asked Bob what was wrong with it they had no idea where they were and they weren't aware of any free power board replacement by LG and they hadn't bought a replacement power board with them so you know very helpful so Bob called their manager and he said they'd have to special order the parts and schedule another service call Bob got the work order from one of the technicians at his house, and it clearly had written on it, power board replacement. <laughs> he questioned the technicians further, and they finally admitted that neither of them had ever serviced an LG LED before. Bob actually had a YouTube video download showing the entire power board replacement process, so he trained the technicians. Yep. Needless to say, it was a long, stressful, frustrating, and fruitless day, so he called LG Corporate again and told them the whole story. They created their own work order and assured him that they would expedite getting the replacement part and oversee things to make sure it was done properly. But for now, Bob still is at square one and obviously he has his doubts about what will happen next hopefully next week will be better i would love to say that this i would not love to say it but i would like to blame this on the fact that you're in the philippines and somehow Uh. the philippines is like a third world you know wild west but i am absolutely certain this happens right here in america all the time so i mean you know lg this is what they do they they can't have repair teams all over the place they just oh i mean it's it's very standard to you know subcontract out to local repair shops but uh uh, yeah, clearly not a ton of vetting going on when you know yes, people show up. The, it says on their work order, written flat out, you know, power board replacement. You think maybe you need to bring one of those power boards? You know, if you're going to replace it, it's kind of a clue. I think you ask what's wrong with the TV before you yeah, take it off the wall. That too. That's what yeah. I think. <laughs> one would think. So, I'm very sorry yeah. about that, Bob. I'm sorry that we yeah, played any part in it by encouraging you to call LG. I mean, at first he was wow. happy. He's like, oh, That's this brilliant. all sounds like it's going to be way better than I anticipated. So, he was he was happy to go with it at first, but then things turned out this way. So, uh, Well, the six. same thing, you know, I mean, I, I contacted Samsung because my uh, Samsung refrigerator ice maker was shot it wasn't working corrupt and he was making all kind of weird noises and i did all their their troubleshooting and stuff like that and they sent a technician out and that dude knew everything right. he's like i've done 10 of these right. today because <laughs> there's a clash action lawsuit about it and i do this this is you know eight out of ten repairs in a day i will do will be the will be this i'm like well i mean he was in and out totally professional everything went right. great but that's not always no. the case my parents have had problems with their refrigerators and other appliances washers dryers stuff like that and the texture shouldn't come out and they're like so what's wrong with it and they're like what do you mean what's wrong with it we called the company and they they sent you oh i know yeah four visits later and completely replacing almost every internal circuit and the thing still doesn't work right you know it, it can happen so sorry bob hopefully everything works out for you let's get to the questions for this week james James has a living room set up with 5.0 speaker configuration at the moment. But his big problem is that he doesn't have a subwoofer. So anyway, sorry about that. Fixed. Go to uh, 
SVS and fix your problem. Anyways, he has all clips reference premiere speakers, a, a 280F towers, two, 250C center, 402S bipole surrounds, powered by a Moran Slim Line SR1506 uh, receiver. This is an apartment. It doesn't have any room treatments yet. He'd be more in favor of things like wall hangings and thick drapes rather than dedicated acoustic panels. They are on the, they are on the menu, though, and since he has recently moved in, things are not complete in his pictures. The surround speakers will get proper placement, although probably on stands rather than wall-mounted, and he is borrowing a clip subwoofer to test it out, but he doesn't own one yet. Again, SVS is your friend. Though that that clips sub you have is actually one of the that looks ones, like so. that looks like one of the fifteen inches just eyeballing it. Yeah, that's, so that is uh, yeah that's that that's one of the, that's one of the ones I would be okay with. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so the, everything's white. Uh, he's got, he's got his TV over his fireplace in the center channel, way above yeah, that. Yeah, it's uh, way like, it's right against the ceiling. On the ceiling, <laughs> actually, the 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 little bar light fixture. Is you, the the little cans that come off the little little what do you call those spotlight not spotlights uh, track like lights, can lights basically so, yeah. track lights right uh, are so, it, this speaker is so high that the the lights are partially covered well behind you can see that that they are lower than the mm -hmm. top of the speaker and he's kind of in so a this, like L is it kind of in the corner of an L. In the in the knee of an L, basically, right. so it's it's open to the left and open to the right of his setup. He's facing a fireplace, which is like within the elbow of an L shape. Uh, so yeah, the apartment setup. So of course it's open up to the kitchen and dining area, and open up over to. I wonder the if this is actually a circle. I wonder if you can go through the kitchen and go think around. So. Like, that I think he's in a corner a, apartment. Yeah. Is what's going on. Yeah. Okay. Well, it's nice. It looks it's nice, nice but yeah, it definitely looks uh, reflective. You know, it's a hard floor. He does have a rug uh, presently, and he's got his couches, but nothing else. But it's not like he's opposed to, or he might even have acoustic treatments. He just hasn't put them up yet because they recently moved in. Right. So he's got a bunch of about three uh, to three point five thousand dollars. Is that right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, those are U.S. dollars, even though he's in Canada. And his priority is dedicated music listening. He uses an NVIDIA Shield 2019 to stream Spotify, YouTube Music, and FLAC files from his Plex server. He wants better musicality. He's taken that term from Robert Haley's The Complete Guide to High-End Audio. That doesn't mean anything to me. Where the basic idea is to try to get as close to the sound of live music as possible. James wants to hear the entire signal with no distortion or noise, with a low no noise floor and great imaging. Everything is plenty loud enough already with clip speakers yep. that he's sitting that's not that far away from, so not shocking anybody. So he asked, would it make sense to replace this Morant slim line? He was considering a NAD receiver. It seems as though Dirac might be a nice upgrade. He's more concerned with sound quality than features. He also has the option to add a stereo amplifier to his Morant slim line since it had pre-outs, but only for the le front left and right speakers and subwoofer. What do we think on that front? Waste of money. So definitely not an external <laughs> amp for absolutely oh, you, not you, an external amp i mean unless you really really hate your neighbors right and your own ears because <laughs> even then like and, would you ever even <laughs> even make any use of an external amp so that is completely off the table um now i'm going to have a different answer in regard to potentially upgrading the av receiver than i mean i'm assuming tom that you're saying yeah, just keep the receiver you have because it is adequate it's 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 adequate. It's got X XT, no, right? No, it's only multi-Q. Uh, it's not XT. Oh, it doesn't... Mm. Yeah. So, uh, honestly... But this is, you know... <sighs> uh, this is, you know, this is not one of the times where I look at, uh, you know... You started this thing off talking about room treatments and stuff like right. that. So, you know you have room yeah. issues, right? And it, in every case where you start off knowing you have room issues, the first solution is not room correction, because that's the that's the last thing that like the cherry on top of the the acoustics, yes. you know, the room acoustics I issue. So, I if I were going to do this, I would spend. I'm just, you know, saying, you know, if you were going to spend all of this on making your room sound better and having mm -hmm. getting that that clear sound that you're really looking for, and subwoofer was not part of this equation, and th thirty five hundred dollars is what you had to spend, I would spend three thousand of it on the room and five hundred dollars on the receiver. Not the other uh, way around. Yeah, so I mean, I'm really glad that we have the images that we do, uh, because it, yeah. you know it's clear like the way it is currently definitely has acoustic issues. But even if you spend three thousand dollars on nothing but acoustic treatments, um, 
and, and treat this room as much as is reasonable and possible. You still have to be able to live in the place and have it look like a normal place because it's open throughout the entire thing. It's still going to be a challenging acoustic environment. This still is not yeah. a dedicated listening room, no matter what you do in here. Um, and so that's where, for me, I have a little bit differing opinion than Tom because... Uh, to me, when you're in the situation where you do as as much as you reasonably can with passive room treatments, but you know there are still issues, and like one of his goals is to get away as much as possible from that. I can tell I'm listening to speakers versus a live performance, and try and get as close to that. This sounds uncannily real performance. That is the area where the most sophisticated type of room correction, like Dirac can have some influence there that that's to me where Dirac can make some of a difference over uh what odyssey multi qxd32 could because even though it's still the cherry on top it is the more sophisticated system that does do more correction to the reflections in the room and no matter what happens in this room you're going to have some reflection issues so i would definitely start and still look to spending the majority of the budget that you have on room treatments. Now I'm looking at the back wall behind your couches that you've got yes. there. And I'm like that, that, that whole wall should be covered. And I'm thinking like he has kids. We see kids toys that are out there. He's got a yeah, dog. Yeah. I'm like, I'm sure you got photos. I'm sure you've got family photos. Get some of those printed on acoustic panels. You can do so at Gick or at Acoustamac or since you're in Canada at uh, Acoustic Panels Canada. All of them do printing on their panels. Uh, you know, he was saying he'd rather go with like drapes or heavy curtains or wall hangings or something. But like, no, get get photos. Get photos that are yours printed on acoustic panels. Uh, basically, in, in this type of setup, as many as you can, wherever makes sense. I'm like, I'm looking over by his kitchen dining area. I'm like, there's blank wall spaces there. All of that is echoes. Put panels up there. It looks like a perfect place to hang some pictures. Get some pictures printed on panels. Over on the left-hand side, which looks like the entrance that's coming in. Um, you know, again, bare walls, things are going to be echoing in there. Maybe that's a good place for some like uh, shaped panels, you know, ones that are hexagons or, or uh, you know, put them in a diamond pattern or something like that. Make it kind of interesting. He's, always got, he's already got like triangular shelves hanging on there. So some interesting shapes can make sense there. But treat that as much as you can. I'm thinking probably about $2,000, $2,500 is going to be going right. towards that. After that, uh, I mean, honestly, he's saying he wants to hear everything that's in the signal, yet you have to get a sub um, right now. That is true. You're yeah. just not getting it. Now, are we going to go for multiple subs in this setup? Uh, do you really care strongly about more than one seating position? You know, if critical music listening, usually that's a one or two person activity, um, not the whole right. family getting together and listening for hours critically to music. So I'm thinking in this oddly shaped room uh, where you probably don't have that many placement choices for the subwoofer anyway, it probably does make more sense to get one good sub um, that's, you know, one of his next questions, but if there's money left over, like I could kind of see my way to like a NAD T758, um, you can actually go to, uh, shoot, what was the name of that place? Uh, something in sound HQ, right? The, uh, place that sells refurbished, um, um yeah, NAD, yeah. NAD, you know, stuff. cause th that, that I could be an option, but at the same time, you can probably more readily afford something like an X3600. Uh, Den and X3600 that would at least get you XT32. Um, you know the improvement that you could have over that can be genuine over the regular Mult EQ that you have right now. So that's sort of the order I would go in. Lion share on the acoustic treatments. Definitely go for printed panels in here. Um, if you are going to do thick curtains, yeah, you want the thickest curtains and way more than you would normally need because what you want to do is bunch them up. Tons and tons of pleats. Yeah, that's not going to do a ton, it, though. Not as, as much as, as actual panels. Yeah. So spend the money this on panels, a, uh, subwoofer you know, after that, and if you still have money, uh, then yeah, go ahead and look. I would probably point you to an X3600. That makes the most sense financially. Uh, but it's Safe and Sound HQ that sells refurbished NAD. You could look for a T758 over there. Yeah. I would be okay. I mean, it, upgrading your, like I said, it, I'm spending most of the money on the room. A sub would be second. Well, yes, second. Be part of that plan. And only if I had spent all the money I thought I needed to spend on room treatments would I, and I had money left over would I look at the receiver. Right. But like Rob said, I would probably just stick with, uh, well, it, you know, I, I'm always with accessories for less because we're down here, uh, up there, it's you Gibby's. know, wherever you can get you, it for Gibby's, yeah. <laughs> you know, get, get, 
I would get whatever was the least expensive, you know, because I'm cheap. Right. But this is also like this is the thing I'm running into in my house because, you know, we just redid our whole kitchen, right? We got gray floors. We got uh, whitish gray countertops whenever they get in. We've got lots of wood everywhere because of the, 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 the cabinets. But there's no, you know, the walls are all white and there's a lot of them. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, dude, this place needs some color. Yeah. This is where room treatments really shine. And you don't have to get the four foot, you know, the four foot by two foot nope. by four inch thick boxes. You don't have to do that. You don't have to do that. They have all kinds of shapes. They sure do. You know, you don't. You know what you don't have to do? You don't have to hang them like boxes. You can hang them like triangles or diamonds or whatever. Mm-hmm. So you can get a lot of that stuff, and you spend a little bit extra and get the ones that have like the molded edges and stuff like that. And then you end up with accent. You know, sh- I mean, you can literally put a grid pattern up on your wall with these things. Hang them. That l- I started doing is getting those. Um, they look like the e- end of a coat hanger, but you just push them into the wall and okay. turn them around. And they are like the easiest thing uh, to hang. They go right into on. drywall, yeah. and they hang the panels. And you could just, you know, put a little bit of piano wire or whatever that wire stuff is behind your panel if they don't have anything already to hang it with. Comes out really, really good. And it's really easy to. You're like, oh, I don't like where it is. I'll move it over an inch, and it's a whole. It's a pinhole. Yeah. I mean, you could just. It, it, it's it's easy as pie to fix. So one so, thing I wanted to address is I know someone comes and says, I've got $3,000, $3,500 to spend. I want to improve my sound quality. You know, what's what's the sexy gear that I can buy? And we're like, right. buy some insulation with a picture printed on it. You know, like, <laughs> no. I know, I know it isn't the visceral, oh, you know, open up the box and, you know, breathe in the electronic smell. Like I know it isn't that stuff, but what you described, you are a critical listener. You've got good speakers already. I mean, we could talk about speak, but like for thirty five hundred dollars, you're not going to get five new speakers to upgrade on your reference premieres. That's just and even if you did, you would still happen. have all the same room it, issues the, the you're room, having right like now. Like if you if you think to yourself, the room is fifty percent of my sound system. If you think of it that way, then it makes a ton of sense to spend the money with yeah. the way we've said. So he asked, should he add a subwoofer or two? Again, apartment and volume levels are not an issue. He's thinking subs might help with the lowest notes and overall accuracy. Mm-hmm. What do we think? He hears all the recommendations for SVS, but would it be out of the question to get the Klipsch sub? It, sh- it would be nice if uh, the aesthetics all matched. So does Klipsch offer any subs that are com- uh, comparable in quality? They do. And and we, we like we said, the one you've got in there right now right. looks like one of the one of the good ones. Uh and honest, but I'll be honest with you. I'm looking at your room, and I'm looking to the right of your couch, in between your couch and your chair, and that's exactly where I would stick a sub. Ain't nobody gonna see it anyways. So, <laughs> you know, I don't love the, the your current placement, which is just to the left of your front left speaker. Uh, and 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 I I'm one of the first ones who was like, oh, you know, kids, blah blah blah. You don't have to worry about them; they'll figure it out. Dude, Mike, I'd, I'd run into that thing, like, all the time. <laughs> and, I mean, also, you know, right now, the one he's borrowing, it's not decoupled from the floor. So, definitely, yeah. whatever you get, decouple it from the floor. Yeah. Uh, have damping yeah. underneath it. Um, one thing that I wish <laughs> Klipsch would change in their subs, because I, what I would point you to, you definitely going to want to go with their SPL series. That is yeah. uh, the ones that match your reference premiere line of um, speakers. So the SPL series of subs is what you want to go for. The SPL 120, which is the 12-inch version, would not be a terrible choice, particularly when it's mostly about music. Uh, it's yeah, minus 3 dB too. point is 24 hertz. So does it dig right down flat to 20 hertz for the lowest movie rumbles? No, but music doesn't go down there anyway. And right. that's that's still a pretty reasonable one. It's 700 US dollars. It's about a thousand Canadian dollars if you buy it locally. Um, there is the larger, it looks like the one you already have, the SPL 150, the 15 inch or that, that plays minus three dB at 18 Hertz. It's 1150 US dollars. But the one feature they're missing is they do not have fully variable gain. They only have a 0, 180 polarity switch on them. Oh, and when you're dealing the... with one sub and potentially limited uh, placement options, having that fully variable phase is nice. However, it, when you only have the one sub, you can play with the distance setting in your AV receiver and more or less mimic difference. variable yeah. phase that way. When you only have one sub, uh, it, it's much easier to do that. So even though the the physical measure with a tape distance uh, <laughs> distance might be completely different, uh, what you're doing is playing with the delay of the signal um, to potentially sort out some issues there. So not the end of the world, you definitely could go, could go clips if you're just like, I much prefer having the looks. Then yeah, one of those, the SPL 120 or the SPL 150 are, are quite reasonable to consider. And I'm, you know, on this podcast, I am all the time harping on the fact that's you know a subwoofer isn't a subwoofer if it doesn't play subsonic notes. <laughs> you know, there's no there's no point even calling it a subwoofer. But 
in if you are honest, if you're being honest with us about your music mm-hmm. and that it's all about the music and you rarely watch TV, even though there's a massive TV in this room, <laughs> uh, that's fine. You'll care about movies in the low notes. Then, yeah, there's no reason why you can go with the 12 incher that only goes down, only goes down to 24 right. hertz. Eclipse, this clutch sub is perfectly reasonable and it's going to, it's going to dig low. It's going to dig. You're going to go, man, this, how much lower does it go? It goes, uh, it goes lower. <laughs> it goes <laughs> it half does. an octave lower, but you know, yeah, out yeah. of the subs that you can buy from a big brand at a retail store, yeah. like walk into a Best Buy and walk out with it, Klipsch yeah. is at the top for, for me. So that's... Uh, it is, yeah. yeah. Klipsch it's and very Velodyne, hard to, basically. Yeah, well, yeah, Velodyne. But Velodyne's quite a bit more expensive, yeah. too. So <laughs> you know, to get something... These are... Klipsch has actually really impressed me with their ability to, to put out subs that are reasonably priced yeah. and reasonably... Yeah. Like, okay, so for $700, can you get something better from SVS? You know, or at least not better, but goes lower right. and louder or, or whatever. HSU. Yeah. yeah, you can. Yeah. Yeah. You absolutely can. Mm-hmm. You can. But, you know, aesthetics are sometimes important to people. And that's not an invalid thing to worry about. And I about. will say, and if it, he's if he's shopping in Canada, that price difference largely disappears. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, yeah, yeah, it's in Canada, it's much more reasonable to look at one of these clipshes, honestly. He asked, what about the, those wall hangings and anything else to cut down reflections? Are they going to make a difference and increase the musicality of a sound system more than the change of a, uh, receiver, amps, or adding subwoofers? So musicality, that word usually implies something, any, I mean, it's so many things, but a lot, I, I've heard it reply to uh, I, I, implying like more liveliness of the room. You know, it's a more echoey kind of thing. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, it, it's got, it, it feels more reactive. <laughs> but like, uh, I've like also he heard it this like, is about making it sound more like live music versus I can tell right. these are speakers. Yeah. So, I, I mean, I don't know what that means to you <laughs> because a lot of times, you know, people are like, I want it to sound like it's an actual concert. And then they go buy a Yamaha and they put it on rock mode. They're like, yeah, <laughs> I, I'm here. And I'm like, oh, my God, you have ruined it. But so I, I, I don't know. But wall hangings, you know, curtains and stuff like that. They are aesthetic to me. They are not going to be doing a whole lot. I mean, the if you only, really do go for a thick and bunched up, they are better than absolutely nothing. And so for like, I mean, but that's the, that's the bar we're setting right here right. when we say you go with curtains. But like, he's got it's lots better of than windows and stuff like that. So yeah. you know, if if the choice is over those windows, I'm going to have blinds or I'm going to have a big thick pleated up curtain, then the big thick pleated up curtain is superior to like some shutters or blinds. But I'm looking at the aesthetic of this place mm-hmm. and putting a big thick pleated up curtain that's <laughs> going to be essentially a blackout curtain in this room yeah. doesn't really go with what you're going with here. Yes. So, you know, I think it makes more sense to do all the acoustic treatments either with printed printed pictures on them or do some sort of uh patterns design choice patterns and you know make one and, and make an entire wall you know <laughs> out of it or something uh okay so does it will it make a difference and increase the musicality of a sound system more than the change of a- receiver amps that's not going to make a big difference it's just not not if you did nothing but change your receiver you go i don't i'm not right nothing I got nothing. If you added an amp, you would be literally, if you heard <laughs> yeah. something, it would literally be that nothing. Is, you are just making it up. Uh, the subwoofer will at least add something yes. to the room. Yeah, the subwoofer will, will allow you to hear more of the signal than you are hearing right now. That was one of the That's criteria right. I was looking for. That is something I can certainly get behind. So yeah, I, I'm still in favor of the same order. Treat the room, number one. Subwoofer, number two, can certainly get behind that. If there's still money left, then an upgrade on your room correction could make a little bit of a cherry on top difference, but it's the the third and right. definitely last on the list. Last. Far, far last, especially this year. Even though it's probably the sexiest. <laughs> yeah, I know. You want to buy some amps, dude. If I you want to buy some amps, sell all your speakers. Yeah, right. <laughs> buy some, get some Magnapans or something so we can justify it. All right, on a bit of a different topic, he has some Ultra HD Blu-ray files on his Plex server, and he's using his NVIDIA Shield for playback. The playback is not smooth. There are lots of dropped frames or video stuttering. He's using his TELUS router, or router, I guess, because he's in mm-hmm. Canada. It you is guys a are all weird. And it doesn't seem to have any issues moving around 150 uh, plus megabits per second. So is this something other than just a bandwidth issue? He isn't doing any sort of transcoding on the Plex uh, server side, just direct playback. And this is, uh, yeah. Yeah, so uh, I wanted to mention uh, Kevin, we talked about it at the top of the show. Uh, He wrote in to say, 
um, that he has also been having issues with his NVIDIA Shield. This is the tube version, so it's not the NVIDIA Shield Pro. It's the regular 2019 NVIDIA Shield that looks like a cylinder. And he went searching around the internet and found quite a few other people uh, talking about um, basically stuttering and buffering when trying to play back Ultra HD Blu-ray backups via Plex on that device. Now, there's a couple of things. I've got the older, I think it was the 2015 or 2016 NVIDIA Shield, and I have the 2019 NVIDIA Shield Pro. And people were like, sometimes I play the Ultra HD Blu-rays and it plays back fine on those. I'm like, two things. Number one, the older Shield, it stutters like crazy unless I have the Ultra HD Blu-ray file on a USB hard drive and have that USB hard drive plugged directly into that NVIDIA Shield. Then it plays back smooth and fine, but anything over my network whatsoever, there is at least a little bit of stuttering and a little bit of buffering, and I've got a really strong network. On the NVIDIA Shield Pro, even on that one, it it usually doesn't get a mo through a movie entirely smoothly uh, unless it's like... Uh, the direct connection over the network, as in uh, it's directly connected to the wireless router that is physically plugged into my NAS units that are storing it. That seems to work okay, or plugging it in USB, which is what I do. For Ultra HD black backups, I just plug it in with USB. So it just seems to mostly be an issue with the Wi-Fi connection. Um, because there's way more error correction going on with any Wi-Fi connection than most of us are aware of. Um, it, it's just not constantly stable. And like Ultra HD Blu-rays are flinging around an average of 70 or, 70 or 80 megabits per second and can go up to, I think it's 160 or something like that at, at maximum peaks. Um, and, and that is just a constant flow of bits coming off of an Ultra HD Blu-ray. It is, it's not really uh, something that's compressed and, and easy to error correct. So it mostly seems to be the wireless issue, uh, regardless of which one. Now, the tube version, it does have less RAM. It's, it doesn't have, well, it's got the same processor in there, but it has less RAM. I don't think the Wi-Fi connection in that tube is a particularly fantastic Wi-Fi radio. Um, so yeah, honestly, the best advice if you've invested in the NVIDIA Shield and the Plex ecosystem is to upgrade to that Pro and have it connected as directly as possible uh, to whatever your storage is. USB is going to be the best. Just have it plugged right in there. That has been rock solid all the time. Uh, but yeah, that that is pretty much the situation there. Okay. I was checking my email, so I didn't hear any of that. But I'm sure it's very exciting mm -hmm. for him. I hope you were... Walking away with your head exploded. All right. He asked me, as a former reviewer for Audioholics, when it came to very expensive gear, $20,000 plus, both audio and video, what kinds of things were those types of customers looking for in a review? Validation? Mm -hmm. Mostly. Mostly validation. Uh, it's very... And I, I this is one of the reasons why, if you look at my reviews, and I, a lot of people think that... The preview articles I wrote, of which I wrote a lot, mm -hmm. uh, are reviews, and they are in, in, in no way a review. They are preview articles, which means that they I looked at the gear and said, huh, this is what I think of that, and mostly what I thought of it was, this sucks. <laughs> <laughs> and that's why they let me do it, because they thought it was hilarious that I would just like tear into these things for, you know, basically. And that's why Nad hates mm -hmm. me, because I would, every time they came out with one of their you know, forever receivers. I'm like, another one? But uh, <laughs> uh, but most people... So $20,000 gear, you know, like all the really super expensive gear that's out mm -hmm. there, what people... What they... The, 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 it's almost impossible to give them a bad review. Mm. You have to... It, it, the gear is so expensive that in the... Not pressure like they're yelling at you or whatever, but peer pressure that you feel <laughs> about giving a bad review like that that blowback you know that you're going to receive online if you put out a bad review of a product like that i mean you don't understand there are glowing reviews i've done glowing reviews i've done of you know thousand dollar fifteen hundred dollar two thousand dollar products said one thing that was you know could use a little bit of improvement and just got absolutely <laughs> slaughtered online people are nuts so a twenty thousand dollar piece of gear uh 
it's very hard to find somebody that will give it a bad review, and there's a lot of reasons for it. One of the reasons is you'll never get another twenty thousand dollars piece of gear. <laughs> they will never right. send you another one. That is the end of it. They they will never send you another one. That's why every single every single review of this type, and it's a formula that is easily recognizable. Every single review of this type starts off with I am perfectly uh, happy with the gear I have. I love it. I never had any any idea that I would ever want to change. And then I got a call from so-and-so head of this company <laughs> who said he wanted to send me this amp that's going to change my life along with some power cord. And then they'd send it over. And the worst thing you'll hear, the worst thing you'll hear in a review like that is, you know, it wasn't sounding right. So we had to switch up the, you know, the the power cord and the ca the cable risers and the little clock in the back. And suddenly it all came into focus. And even my wife from the other room could say, oh, it sounds so much better. It sounds amazing in there. Yeah, you know, it's it's almost impossible to give a bad review of mm. such things. Does that mean that there aren't honest reviews out there? There are. I mean, one of the ways that Audioholics made his, you know, Gene made his name. And it's not common knowledge, but... Uh, when Audioholics first started, before anybody else got involved with it, it was just Gene, he would go down to like the local hi-fi shop and he made friends with those guys and they would let him go in there and take pictures of the gear and listen to it and stuff like that. And he would basically be honest and he'd be like the only one being honest. And that's kind of how Audioholics got started, just by telling the truth. Um, but when you get these big pieces of gear, all people want to hear is that they did not waste $20,000 on this piece of gear. Pretty much. Uh, I can also... You know, and, uh, like comparisons, right? You know, what what are the other twenty thousand, thirty thousand dollar pieces of gear, or what else is in this same sort of category? So, if you can give yeah. some here, here are the advantages that this piece that I'm reviewing has over those other things. Then that's what the customers want to hear too. Yeah. So there's not there, there's really not a lot of uh, it, it's it's very hard to look at uh, a review like that and without. And, and find anything negative and a lot of times you have to really kind of understand the lingo uh as you as i read through these reviews i'm like oh yeah you don't really like it <laughs> <laughs> you can kind of tell i mean he's saying this but what he really means is that because the, the 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 shades of any sort of any sort of anything other than pot glowing positive thing you know is uh a, a big fat warning sign in the review like that so that's why they never gave me that stuff because i told them i didn't well first of all i told them i didn't want it and second of all they were like we're not giving it to you we'll never get another one so you know not that they you know they did whatever gene just says it had a completely different way of doing reviews where you know he's looking at the the specifics of how it actually performs mm -hmm. especially amps and receivers and stuff like that where i was never really doing that i don't have the expertise or the equipment to do those kind of tests so it was just better that they kept me on the cheap stuff so all right, Enrique. Enrique would like to get a projector and a screen that he could use outside. It all needs to be portable, and he's hoping the projector and screen together could cost $600 or less, although he's willing to go a bit above that if it's the only way. As big an image as possible, any suggestions? Projector and screen that he could use outside. Yeah. Uh, this is, I mean, this screams like audio gone eBay, you know, first suppose. of all. You know, you know, at least for the screen, that's what I would be looking for. But uh, what do you got, Rob? Uh, so for the screen, Carl's Place. Uh, Carl's Place has an entire section for backyard theaters, outdoor theaters, very durable, easily washable uh, vinyl screens that are easy to hang. Or in fact, they have an entire sort of like... Um, uh, frame system if you need it to be freestanding they have that available too um, for the price point that you're talking about you're probably going to go for the uh, 120 inch size maybe the 100 I think there's actually like 139 inches diagonal instead of 135 or 140 but it's going to be probably one of those two if you just get the type that you can hang and easily clean it's going to be about 150 to 175 dollars um, okay. so that leaves you you know 400 450 dollars something like that for the projector I can't quite get you there with something that I'm gung-ho recommending. Uh, for outdoors, I definitely want you to go DLP. Don't even consider LCD because DLP, the light path is sealed. So no dust, no debris can get into the lamp and light path assembly in a DLP projector. It theoretically can in LCD. If it gets past the filter, uh, the light path is open in an LCD and you can get dust on the panel or on the back of the lens and it's near impossible to clean it off. So DLP is the only thing I would consider here. And Optima's HD146X is where I would point you. It is a 1080p panel. Uh, you don't have to downgrade to a, you know, XGA or something. It's a 1080p panel, nice and bright, you know, 3000 plus lumens, uh, and honestly, half decent color 
uh, which is like kind of hard to find. Now, the retail price on that is $550. So if you got the 150-inch college play screen on the $550, well, I put you $100 over budget. You can find the Optima HD 146X uh, refurbished, or it's called renewed for $475. And that gets you really, really close uh, to the price point that you were hoping for. So that's where I would point you. Okay. David. David was running four subs, two big F12s that are positioned near field to his seats and two SVS SB1000s further away. He used a mini DSP to tune and EQ them all. Now he has sold his pair of SB1000s upgrade to dual SB3000s. He still has it in mind that he wants to use his four subwoofers, but by comparison, the big F12s are underpowered now and he wants to use SB3000s to their full potential. What's the best procedure for level matching and then adjusting all four of them together using Room EQ Wizard? It's time to say goodbye to the F12s. Can we can we not do this, please? So, okay, if I was going to do this, which I would not in any way, shape, or form, if if you were like, I just want to use all four of these subs, mm. I just want to, I would position the two SB three thousands as I would put as if I had no other subs. Okay, yeah, just as uh, a pair. so, just as a pair. So that would mean one in the front of the room, one in the back of the room, mm -hmm. or opposing corners or something along those lines. Then I would take your BIC F12s, and I would position them near field, but co-located as much as possible, okay. like right next to each yeah. other. So right behind your couch, mm -hmm. maybe. Together, side by uh, side, or stacked side by on side. top of each other. Yes. And then I would use those as like a mid base mm, module sure. the way that hsu used to sell a mid base module but nobody bought it because it was impossible mm -hmm. to integrate into your system easily and all that but you have room Re wizard and you could kind of do this uh but that's how i would do okay. it i would not try to play i would not run your bix full range okay because they ain't making it down <laughs> so you might as well just place the sb 3000s as if the bix were in the room then if you really wanted to use them i would use them uh, you know, from like the you know, 180 hertz, maybe, you know, 80 hertz down to like 50, 70, 79. <laughs> So, I mean, for people who are like, you know, why was he using Big F12s with uh, SB1000s? Those are not so worlds apart in terms no, of output and extension. The Big F12 is a pretty darn reasonable subwoofer, honestly. And it's a ported design that genuinely gets down to about 25 hertz. And the SB1000s are a sealed design that gets down to about 24 hertz. So though, using those together was not unreasonable at all. But the SB3000s are in a new class. They're a different class of receiver. And there isn't really a viable way to use those four subwoofers together together two sb 3000s and two bic f12s as though they were four identical subs your lowest common denominator you have to peel back what the sb 3000s can do and limit them to the capabilities of the f12s if you're trying to use all four equally so i agree with tom you could try the mid base module type of setup near field co-located i would just say goodbye to them. I would just use the two SB3000s. I would use my 12-step guide if you don't have a rectangular enclosed room where you can just use geometry to put them at the midpoints of opposing walls or diagonally opposite corners. If your room is oddly shaped or open, I would use my 12-step guide. If you insist on using, uh, you know, th like either the F12s together as one co-located sub uh, or as a mid-base module, you can use that multi-sub optimizer software. Uh, the multi-sub optimizer combined with Room EQ Wizard is the best way to integrate more than two subwoofers together. Uh, yes. Uh, again, I do want to agree with Rob that the number one thing I would do is get rid of these sure. things. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> that's not really... that 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 is what I would do first because they are more in my opinion more trouble than they're worth and not adding enough to even be worth any at trouble at this point they're less, holding you back before we we were like yeah. that's okay because combined with SB1000s yeah. not so far apart that it was unreasonable but now they're just holding you back yeah just save up for some more SBs <laughs> yeah if you really want four <laughs> Mark, Mark previously asked uh, us for speaker recommendations for a living room that is vaulted and open to a loft. He also asked if he should only consider 6-ohm speakers since his Onkyo 646 receiver specs higher wattage into 6-ohm instead of 8-ohms. We said that in this setup, it would benefit from efficient speakers, and we suggested that HSU HC1 Mark II. After Mark looked around the bed, he ended up going with Clips Reference 620F Towers. He preferred the form factor. The price was acceptable, and he already had a Clips Center, and they 
easily play loud enough. That's mm. great. Uh, immediately upon swapping out his old left-right speakers for these new Klipsch Towers, not only were they louder, but a surround seemed to suddenly get louder too. He had to dial everything down a bit. Is that because the Klipsch Towers are so much more efficient that they freed up more power for his surrounds? No. Nope. I don't know. It's that sounds are that rarely works. playing out of only one speaker. Uh, yeah. You probably, some of those surround effects were actually, it might not sound like it, but a little bit of reinforcement was coming from your fronts <laughs> and they were louder. Now it sounded like he kind of plugged everything in and maybe didn't do a complete new setup with the room EQ. Now, granted, this is an Onkyo 646, so that's Onkyo's Accu EQ, the low end version of Accu EQ that Tom and I would agree. Um, we don't mind running it for just setting your distances and levels. Uh, but after that point, we would turn it off and not actually use the equalization that it applies because we don't think AccuEQ does a very good yeah. job at all. We think it does more harm than good. Uh, but for just setting your distances and levels, it's perfectly fine to use that way. So this was a bit of, um, it's. I guess you can call it psychoacoustics, but it's, it's more just a matter of some of that sound from your surrounds is actually mixed into the fronts. There's a bit of a blend there. So you were getting higher output overall because the new speakers are much more efficient than your old ones. That's right. Even though these Klipsch towers seem to easily uh, be able to easily play l lower and louder, should he still use an 80 hertz crossover? Yes. I, I want to get that like tattooed on me someplace. <laughs> you know, I think it should be in the... Where's our low... I can't see the lower third, the lower thing. On, we should put that down there. <laughs> 80 hertz crossover. Someplace on here. No matter the size of your front speakers. No matter speakers. what. I don't care what your front speakers are. 80 hertz crossover. Sorry. Yes. I'm not going to... I don't think we need to explain that again. He knows He knows the oh, answer. That, that, That's why he, he asked. Was, it was a confirmation thing. He's like, really? Yeah. You sure? Yep. We're sure. Yep. We're sure. <laughs> he considered the even larger Eclipse Reference 820F towers, and we would have still said 80 hertz crossover in case <laughs> you're wondering. That's true. But, but a sales rep told him that the 620Fs would be better matched for his Onkyo receiver. <laughs> this is what he was told. <laughs> That he might burn out the 820s tweeters by underpowering them. Any truth to that? No. So, I mean, weirdly to me, this sales rep kind of fell bass backwards into a recommendation that we actually kind of agree with, which is that the 620 towers between the two tower choices uh, does make more sense. Like you're saying, these things actually play louder than I need them to. So great, you you got the right choice. You paid less. Right, that is the right thing. Yes, you yeah. know, went with speakers that you can drive to their full capabilities, uh, and it's it's louder than you need it to be. So you 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 wound up at the right result, but not for the right reasoning. Um, so uh, the thing is, could your Onkyo actually drive the 820 towers to their full capabilities? And the answer there is no. That uh, They don't right. have a big enough power supply and powerful enough amplifiers to take maximum advantage of every last decibel that the bigger 820 towers can output. Uh, but would you blow up your tweeters as a result of that? Well, if you cranked the volume knob to the point that things start clipping then that's, that's kind of where there's a little bit of truth to that because that's what will blow up your tweeters, right? Uh, like we were talking about with, with Daz before, right? You turn up the volume so high that um, you actually do drive your amplifier into clipping. That's where you could, you could damage a tweeter. But with Klipsch Towers, things would be so loud before you ever got to that point that your eardrums would be bursting before the tweeters gave up yeah. from amplifier clipping. So it all... Ludicrous. Yeah. I've never heard such a thing that... <laughs> there's, that... there's like little bits of truth in there, but yeah, it's... It, it really needs to be cleaned up. Did and... he think he was selling Martin Logan's or I something? Don't... Is that what he thought he was selling? I, I, I don't, don't know what he... Really... he... I think maybe he learned about Martin Logan and has just applied it across right. the board. But I mean, there is the, you know, there is the, the Onkyo you have wouldn't drive the eight towers, 80, 820 towers to maximum. Uh, they don't no. have that much power. Uh, there is such a thing as turning up the volume high enough that you can damage a tweeter uh, with clipping. That's true. Uh, and the 620s are actually the right choice for you. So you wound up with the right result. <laughs> That's right. Give a blind man enough darts and he's going to hit the bullseye eventually. Sure. And that's what happened here. Yeah. Alex. Alex picked up an LG CX OLED sooner than expected mm -hmm. and an NVIDIA Shield. We mentioned how you pretty much have to, to 
uh, just just have to put the new LG OLEDs into movie maker mode or FSC picture mode, and you really don't have to mess with calibration after that. What did I say? IFC. It's not even the same IFC. letter. IFC. <laughs> ISF Imaging Science. You know what it is? It's IFSC. IFSC is the <laughs> International Federation of Sport Climbing, okay. and that's what happened there. <laughs> nice. ISF picture mode, and you really don't have to mess with calibration after mm -hmm. that. But he hasn't bought a TV in the last ten years, and there are a gazillion other mm -hmm. settings. There's AI this and dynamic that, <laughs> automatic modes for everything, and even ads whenever you bring up the menus. So when they have any tips and advice about how to sort through all that stuff and maybe turn those ads off, uh, well, once you just set it to IFSC setting, then you'll be fine. <laughs> ISF setting. It's all climbing all the time. It's Tom's perfect TV. So it's all he wants to watch. Unfortunately, if uh, you have the TV connected to the internet uh, and the internet uh, connection is active, there is no way to get rid of those ads. There's no way to opt okay. out of the ad showing up if you have an internet connection. So the only thing you can do there is not have the TV connected to the internet. Um, it'll there'll still be a slot there or something will still show up where the ad would go, but it, it won't be a you know new live ad every time if there's no internet connection. But otherwise, there's nothing you can do there. Uh, the major things to set that are outside of the picture mode are the power settings because out of the box it comes in energy star mode where it is severely limiting the peak light output of your tv uh lee when he got his oled was like oh that's the ruin your new tv mode that's what the <laughs> energy star power saving mode is and by default it is in that and it's separate from the picture mode so you definitely want to turn all the power saving type of stuff off you don't want any of the AI stuff. You don't want any of the dynamic stuff. If you put it in movie maker mode or ISF dark mode, virtually all of those things are gone. But then there are like AI sound and like dynamic audio mode and all that crap too. I, I don't know if you're using the built-in sound, um, the built-in speakers, but you, you don't need any of that stuff. <laughs> all, the, all the stuff that they're selling as features, you turn it all off. Um, you do want to spend some time in the general tab. So if you go to the all settings, go to the general section and basically just page your way through there because that is where you can set up whether all of your HDMI inputs are at the standard mode, which is what you need if you have any 3D sources, or the enhanced mode, which is what you want if you want to do Dolby Vision, or uh, the new v uh, variable refresh rate mode, which is available on your C10 if you're doing gaming, which, as we discussed at the top of the show, will turn off Dolby Vision, but allow you to do 4K 120 with variable refresh rate. So that's all under the general tab, all of that stuff. It's under mm. your inputs and your advanced options and things like that. Um, so other than that, I'll point you over to Artings, Ratings. Uh, go through their settings because they actually do cover the power setting and how to make sure your HDMI inputs are in the correct mode for your sources. And then for their picture settings, they're like ISF dark mode and we didn't have to do anything else. So that's <laughs> about it. <laughs> So did you already answer this one? The NVIDIA Shield also has a ton of enhancement options mm -hmm. and AI processing. If you want the very best looking picture, how much video processing should be done by the TV versus the source device? Uh, I didn't think that there was much processing to be done at this point, right? I mean, unless it's up converting. Something. Yeah, I mean, they have I mean, their AI upscaling on the NVIDIA Shield, which, yeah. I mean, I do have to say on, on, a, on a good amount of content, so 1080p content or 720p content for that matter, um, that AI upscaling, I mean, subjectively, it does a decent job of making some things look sharper. But every once in a while, there's an artifact in there. It's just sort of inevitable when you're dealing with, you know, artificial intelligence driven upscaling and that every once in a while, there's like a weird pixel that makes a shimmer or something has like a hard line drawn around it when it really shouldn't. Um, and it's it's not all the time. It's I wouldn't even call it common. But when it happens, I'm just like, Egh. so I I end up turning all that stuff off. I'm like, just just output the original signal let my TV show the original signal other than the, you know, necessary amount of scaling just to bring it up to the native panel resolution and all the AI stuff and dynamic stuff and machine learning stuff and everything. I, I wind up turning off because I just really, really dislike any of the occasional um, little weird things. But if you want to try that AI upscaler 
on the NVIDIA Shield, I, I can get behind that. Uh, on a fair amount of content, it does actually make things look uh, subjectively sharper and a bit nicer. Um, I, I'd, I'm not in favor of having the display do a ton of you know processing outside of just the basic scaling from like 1080p to 4K, because it has to. Um, Right. If you want to try it on a source device, like if you had a, one of the old Opal players that had Darby built in, you know, and you want to you want to oh, give that right. a go, I, I'm okay with giving that a go, but I wouldn't do it on the display. I'd try it on the source. Hmm. Yeah, and I wouldn't try it on anything. Yeah. <laughs> just, I mean, I I turn off just all, the, all that off. enhancements. <laughs> yeah, I just 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 turn it all off. <laughs> Uh, so which Ultra HD Blu-ray player would we recommend for to him? He doesn't want to go over five hundred dollars. Uh, we still doing Panasonic or Sony's, or are we doing Panasonic? Panasonic, these days? I don't Panasonic, yeah. yeah. I would definitely go Panasonic here. Now, uh, really, the only question is, how badly do you want your Ultra HD Blu-ray player to output Dolby Vision? Because if you really, really want Dolby Vision to light up on your LG OLED, then in the United States, you have to get the Panasonic UB eight twenty. It's pretty right. much the only player that does everything correctly including Dolby Vision is the Panasonic UB820 it is $500 so i mean it's the there maximum you, you wanted to You're spend not over. <laughs> uh, but you know what if you're like hey my LG C10 OLED it has its excellent dynamic frame by frame tone mapping of HDR10 which essentially it looks just as good as Dolby Vision. There's not really a tremendous need for Dolby Vision with the C10 OLED. Then you could spend much less. You could spend $200 or 250 I think it, 200 and 250 Whatever it is. When it's on sale, I think it's 200 The UB420. So the Panasonic UB420 instead of the 820. Uh, the only difference is that it does not have Dolby Vision. And the build, qu the build am, quality isn't quite as nice, but it's I, still good. I'm a cheap person, but I would probably get the Dolby Vision. Sure. One. If I had five hundred dollars, if you're spend, okay I'd be with like, spending the five hundred, yeah, it's UB only two hundred fifty dollars. I mean, it's a lot of it's a, it's it's money, but it's not like a yeah. lot of money. But then again, I just bought a kitchen, so <laughs> what do I know? MK, is his last name Ultra? <laughs> no. Those are the initials I had to work with. That's oh who. Uh, that's I, what I'm I just I I used to love reading back in the day, like getting into like. Whatever those weird conspiracy theory websites and mm. reading like the MK Ultra accounts. I mean, that was first, a real thing. First hand <laughs> accounts, you know, from people who clearly did not have anything to do with it. And I was just, I just loved reading all that stuff because it was like <laughs> so silly and funny and, you know, kind of goofy and weird. And then conspiracy theory started to become like part of mainstream mm. media. And now I'm, sad about it and i don't want to talk about it anymore but anyways mk ultra has an optima h uhd 60 projector an 1800 dlp but it uses a larger dlp chip that is only wobbled twice per frame instead of four times per frame it got good reviews but mk isn't happy with it uh the five thousand dollar genuine 4k sony vw295 is under consideration what about the newest ultra short throw short throw options can we help in choosing a new projector that would deliver stunning picture quality over the disappointing optima uhd60 i wish i had more information than this because i feel like we don't know when his some, room yeah. situation in terms of we don't know the light you know how much light he's got we don't know what he's he, he could be projecting on the bed sheet we don't know his screen we know. and we don't know his ambient yeah. lighting and we don't know uh like the color of his walls and how reflective they are right and how much light can seep I, in from other places yeah the, i mean yeah honestly that that will answer the question because MK knows. You didn't let us know, but MK knows what his situation is. So what I will say is um, if you have a room where you do not have complete control over the ambient light, where there's always a little bit of ambient light or even when everything is turned off and it's as black as can be, your walls are white and they reflect the light that comes off of the screen and it washes out your image. If that's what you have, then one of the ultra short throws with an ultra short throw screen because if you don't get the correct screen to go with an ultra short throw projector it's going to look terrible uh but if right. you have a situation where you always have some ambient light where a long throw projector is never going to be able to look its best the new ultra short throws are pretty impressive but even then i would say you have to have like like if you can turn all the lights off and the only non-perfect thing is that you have white walls and some of the light gets back onto the screen and washes things out a bit. I would, I still wouldn't opt for one of the ultra short throws in that scenario. I would opt for one mm. of the ultra short throws if you're like, it's never fully black in here. 
Uh, there's always some ambient light. And if I use a long throw projector, the, the blacks and the contrast just never look good. If that's the situation, then an ultra short throw combined with a really good ultra short throw specific screen uh, could be a decent solution here. And that could be the Optima uh, Cinema XP2, which is a darn good model. It could be one of the new Samsung, the Premier uh, models, that LSP9T in particular, if you've got $6,500 to spend on just the projector alone. And then um, like on the quote unquote lower end of screens, elite screens, um, if you go with their CLR, not the CLR2, that's kind of crappy, but the one that's just called CLR for ceiling light rejection, it's pretty good for about $1,500 if you can spend a bit more. I like Elune Vision's ultra short throw screens even better, but that's twenty-five dollars to $3,500 for one of their right. screens. Um, but if the problem that you're having in this room is that you've got a projector and everything else is you know, DIY on the cheap, right. non-optimally set up, no amount of buying a better projector is going to fix your problem. That's right. Yeah. So that's the number one thing we have to know in order to adequately, you know, help you out with this thing. Because I'm I'm looking at the question and just by the question itself, just by you know that this that this Optima is disappointing. I'm like disappointing. Is it really? Well, the thing I mean, is, I feel though, like if he so this is the polar opposite. If you right. went to the lengths of totally blacking out your room. You totally blacked right. out your room. You went for a perfect Lambertian diffusion white screen that evenly distributes the light that hits it. There's no hot spotting. There's no sparklies. It's perfect, beautiful, blended light. And your room is all blacked out. And you got this Optima and you're like, ooh, the black levels are kind of disappointing on this thing. And that's what has disappointed you. Well, then that Sony VW295 is going to look wonderful in that scenario. But... For it or the JVC, like if you went with a JVC NX5, which is the um, the alternative basically to the Sony VW295, also genuine 4K, has even higher inherent panel contrast, but costs a little bit more. Uh, the JVC NX5 does. Um, you know, if you have the fully blacked out room, that's where those projectors are going to strut their stuff. So it really comes down to that. Are you disappointed with your Optima because you blacked out your room, went for a reference white screen, and you're just not happy with the black levels that you're getting from that Optima, which could be the case? Or is it that you're using the Optima in a room that is the polar opposite? There's always some ambient light, and you're like, this thing always looks washed out. If that's the case, then the JVC or the Sony is still going to look washed out. And you're going to feel like you got ripped mm -hmm. off paying $5,000 or $5,500. And you'd be better with an ultra short throw in the lit room scenario. Uh, so, yeah, it's going to be one of those two. It depends on your room and your screen. Yeah. Uh, I need to scroll. Dan. Dan has a large basement room, uh, 46 and a half feet wide by 21 and a half feet deep by 8 feet high. His theater area is going to be in the middle, roughly 20 feet wide. So it's gonna, what? So in the middle of the 46 and a half foot width. So he'll have like, uh, I don't know, 12 and a half feet to his left and 12 and a half feet to his right or, so, or a little bit more than that. Something like 13 feet to his left, 13 feet to his right. 20 okay. foot strip in the middle. Weird. Yeah. yeah. Strange. All right. Uh, in the middle, roughly 20 feet wide. So it'll be open on the left and on mm -hmm. the right. It's literally in the middle of the room. Can't you just push it into a corner? I mean, whatever. It doesn't matter. Uh, oh, and behind it is an unfinished area. That's what fine. it says. <laughs> He's drawn up a plan to sit 12 feet from the front wall and have a 7.2.4 speaker configuration. Excuse me. Since he basically doesn't have side walls, his plans include in-ceiling speakers for surrounds as well for top fronts and top rears. Okay. Top fronts, top rears, front heights, whatever. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Got it. Dan is not looking for project recommendations, but do you like any feedback regarding layout? Is there anything about placement and layout plans that we would recommend changing? I have a couple. I would a recommend. Few. <laughs> yeah. All right. So let me look, look at what we've got sure. going on here. So basically, his 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 surrounds left and right will be basically where his top middles would be. Yeah. Those need. So I mean, I think your scenario is such that I'm not hugely opposed to your surround left and right speakers being in the ceiling, but I would spread them out more. I would have them further to your left, further to your right. Uh, and those ones, I wouldn't mind going for some of like the angled in ceiling speakers for your surrounds. 
uh, so that they are aiming a bit more directly at you. But I would not have them in line with your top fronts and top rears. The positioning of your top fronts and top rears looks totally fine. Those will be in ceiling speakers firing straight down. But the surrounds, I would spread them out further to your left and right and maybe use angled right. speakers for the surrounds. The front speakers are too wide apart. Well, okay. So just so that people who are not seeing sure. this understand what's going on. So what he's got is he's got on either side of his main listening mm -hmm. position, his couch, he's got three speakers in a row, like to his left and his right, just off the side of the couch mm -hmm. arms. And those are his, his fronts, his left surround, his, 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 well, the, the, his the right, left, right surround the speakers. Heights, the Atmos speakers, yeah. The Atmos speakers, the, the surround mm -hmm. speakers, and the Atmos back yeah. speakers are all in the line. Then on the back wall, he's got his surround speaker, his, his surround mm -hmm. backs, but they're out wider. So they are wider than the, right. than the wider Atmos than the speakers Atmos are. Speakers, yep. And the front left and right speakers are like super Yeah, I mean, wide. that's not even going like for the equilateral that. triangle. That's that they're, they're 16 feet apart in his diagram. I don't entirely understand why they're that wide apart in the diagram. I think he's trying to delineate the space. The, the the space of the home theater by this or he's trying to get to the left and right uh but i was gonna say he's trying to get the left and right of his of his screen but his he's, screen I mean, is he's, a he's, flat yeah, panel he's, uh specced a 77 inch i mean clearly the oled a 77 inch flat panel um so yeah right. so your front left and right speakers they should be closer together uh going by the angles that dolby would recommend with your 12 foot viewing distance uh they should be anywhere between uh 10 and 14 feet apart not 16 feet apart um so yeah, I mean I would I would to definitely have them closer <laughs> together. I would probably have them about eleven or twelve feet apart. Um, right. They should be in line with your Atmos speakers. More or less, surround yeah. back should be in line with your Atmos <laughs> yeah. speakers. And what Rob's saying for the left, the left and right surround speakers, putting them further back, just physically distances them from your Atmos speakers. That's right. Speakers I want to get angling. more separation between the Atmos and the surrounds. Like I say, the, the compromise of having your surrounds in the ceiling in this setup makes sense because you just don't have a left and right wall except for way far away. Um, right. So yeah, angled in ceilings for the surrounds, spread out more. Uh, but yeah, the, the, on the speaker side, that's that. His subwoofer placement looks perfectly reasonable, although you need some monster subs in here. You want some power sound audio subs in here because they have to contend with the entire open volume of air that you're dealing with, and that's a lot of cubic feet of air that you're dealing with in here. So yeah. you got to go bigger than you might expect on the subwoofers. And then the last issue to me is the 77-inch OLED. Uh, wonderful display, but from 12 feet away, you're basically looking at a 25-degree field of view kind of small now i wouldn't be opposed to having that screen and a projection screen that can roll down in front of it but uh right. at that kind of distance i want at least a 120 inch projection screen yeah this is far 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 too small yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> i mean it's it's i mean you may be going from a 55 inch that you were sitting 10 feet away from and you're gonna sit 12 feet away from a 77 inch and you're gonna go well, I mean, it's bigger. <laughs> <You're> right. <laughs> I mean, that's going to be, uh, I think that's going to be your reaction. I mean, it's technically larger, and I, I guess it's brighter. And I mean, with, but, with uh, the basement being wide open like it is, you might be in a scenario like we were just talking about where you, it's never fully dark in here. That might be the case. Yeah. And if that's the case, going for a 120-inch ultra short throw screen, with an ultra short throw projector, honestly, like if you go for that Optima Cinema X uh, P2, the price of that, even with a uh, really nice screen, uh, I mean, these days, since the price, thankfully, of the 77 inch OLEDs has come down, you'd be looking at about $1,000 more than the 77 inch OLED, but it's also 120 inches versus 77 right. inches. It's not like you're getting nothing for that extra money. So yeah, to yeah. me, uh, screen size upgrade and all the th things we talked about, speaker positioning. Right. Uh, the other thing I've noticed is that your, uh, your, your back sub is five feet from the center line and your front sub is also five yeah, feet or no, six five feet, feet. your writing yeah, is five feet okay. but just offset one to the right of center at the front of the room and one to the left of center at the back of the room and that's reasonable for where things are that is reasonable it's would be more reasonable if that center line was actually the center of your room this whole space it's pretty close to it though and well we don't know for sure uh, i mean we just saw this uh, this picture that he's got out and it doesn't 
I mean, that left side looks smaller than that right side to me. Maybe. Uh, and so I would place those, again, within the space. Yeah, the whole center space, them not within the, the 46 space. and a half foot width. Center them within that. So <laughs> if you cannot, if you cannot get them, you know, uh, you know, exactly midline center because mm -hmm. there's a, TV there or something, then just make sure that you mirror them on either side. That's the only other thing. I'm All saying. right. All right. Uh, scrolling down. Jack, we mentioned that when doing a subwoofer crawl, we were hoping to find the spot where it sounds as close to even in volume throughout the entire base sweep as possible, correct? Mm -hmm. No big dips uh, is the top priority, but ideally the base sweep would be the same volume throughout. Well, don't the Fletcher, Munchen, Fletcher, Fletcher Munson curves tell us that truly linear bass would not sound linear to our ears or vice versa? If it sounds linear to us, it wouldn't actually measure as being linear. Jack is confused by this. Can we explain? that The, the Fletcher Munson curves shows that as you reduce the volume of mm -hmm. bass uh, overall, you know, it, we hear we subjectively hear that volume differently than maybe it actually is so generally what it turns into is as we turn the bass down it gets subjectively quieter than it is objectively like we can't hear that's it right, as well yeah. like we and that's what uh, it comes the down same to. decibel decrease we would still hear the mid-range but the bass might become completely inaudible even though the numerical this number case, was the same Right. In this case, what we're, we're, we're first of all, you should be playing these at a fairly robust yeah, volume. Yeah, seventy-five to know. eighty-five dB is what we're yeah. aiming for for that bass sweep playing. And at at that case, you know, then this doesn't really take that much of effect. Even if, but even if you have it down lower, which you, the the thing that you might run into is as it gets lower down the, mm -hmm. the frequency range, you're going to have a harder time hearing yeah. it because you've got it the rolls volume down off a at the low. lowest frequencies. Yeah. It would not be like, okay, now, you know, at 80 hertz, it, it sounds like 85 dB to me, but at, you know, 70 hertz, it now sounds like 65 dB because of my hearing. Mm -hmm. That's, uh, unless you have some sort of hearing loss, in which case, well, that's a different story. But for most of us, that would not be the case. So as long as you're keeping the volume, you know, it doesn't have to be at reference <laughs> volume, but loud, loud enough so that you can really hear this. Uh, and I like to keep it loud enough to motivate me to get this done as quickly right. as possible. I mean, one of the reasons <laughs> 85 know? decibels was chosen as reference volume is because at 85 decibels, our hearing is pretty close to linear. So if you're playing yeah. the bass sweep nice and loud between 75 and 85 dB, uh, our human hearing is, is reasonably close to linear at that point. So uh, the bass sweep, though, is uh, the subwoofer crawl is really about does the volume sound like a roller coaster? Does it sound like the volume is swinging yeah. up and down as that bass sweep plays? That's what we're trying to avoid. If you hear a gentle roll off in the deepest bass, yeah, that's perfectly reasonable if you measured it with an accurate microphone it might actually be the same decibel level all the way down and that is our human hearing just not hearing the deepest deepest bass the 30 to 20 hertz bass might have a gentle roll off to it but if it's a gentle roll off we're not worried about that we're we're worried about some like unusual dip compared to all the rest of the volume throughout the rest of the sweep at like 60 hertz there's you know this big dip in the volume You're like oh that's a problem i need to find a different spot yeah so he's looking to buy a 75-inch TV for his kids to use for gaming. They often have four-player games, so the larger screen size would be very helpful. They won't be using the PS5 or Xbox Series X anytime soon, so it doesn't have to be the very latest 4K 120 features. He's mostly just hoping to keep the price down. So what would we suggest? He already has a TCL 6 Series in another room and other Roku's in the house, so should he stick to TCL or should he get a Vizio or something else? TCL does make a... I didn't think they made a 75. I thought they made 65. Uh, no, these days they make 75s. Um, oh, okay. Not only in the 6 Series, which, you know, it's I think it's $1,400 for the 75-inch 6 Series, the R635. And if that's a reasonable price to you, it's a fantastic TV for gaming, honestly. Uh, but if you want to be closer to $1,000, the, the retail price is supposed to be $1,100 on the S. 535 the tcl s 535 right now it's listed at 1200 dollars at amazon so i'm not sure why their price is higher than msrp uh but it's supposed to be 1100 dollars for the s 535 now the s 535 technically it has full array local dimming but it's like 16 zones or something like that uh, so i don't i'm not really worried about the local dimming but what is impressive is that it has 
a backlight, not edge lighting. You actually have lights behind the screen, not just a strip along one edge of the screen. And the S535 is a very reasonable television, uh, particularly when it's like, you know, not your critical viewing TV. You just want big screen size for gaming. It's got right. excellent input lag for gaming. Um, you know, it's a 60 hertz panel. Uh, it doesn't have variable refresh rate, but you're like, you're not looking for all the top features. You want low price, big size, but still reasonable for gaming. Uh, TCL S535 is like the top choice. All right. Andrew, our Molo spaceship guy. I still need to dust that Romulan Warbird. <laughs> it's just pointless because they keep making dust in here. So Andrew has found himself listening to more and more music as of late. Back in the day, he ripped all the CDs he owned into 320 kilobits per second MP3s and got rid of all of his physical CDs. See, I didn't do that last mm. part. I kept all the CDs. I did get rid of all of the cases. <laughs> those all went away. So those files now live on his Plex server. Uh, then he's been using Apple Music, Spotify, the free version, and just recently started a free trial of Tidal Hi-Fi. First up, Atmos Music has sounded awesome so far, but so he's feeling tempted to subscribe to Tidal Hi-Fi just for that. But more than that, the audio quality really does seem to sound better. He's well aware of the differences in uh, volume can make us think one version sounds better than another. So use an SPL meter app on his phone to make sure the volume levels were the same for the record. Spotify always measured louder and had to be lowered. Prior to his Tidal Hi-Fi trial, he had compared quite a few songs that he has in his mp3 library to the streaming versions from spotify and apple music he knows the difference with some but not all the biggest differences seem to be tracks with real as opposed to electronic instruments and live recordings but so far the title eight hi-fi pretty much uh with title title hi-fi pretty much everything seems to sound better is that because it is lossless does it have anything to do with high res audio versus the cds mp3s and ac files he's been streaming uh it has a lot to do with, uh, first of all, 320 uh, MP3s, mm -hmm. I think, are completely reasonable. And I, if you had said I ripped them all to like, you know, 120, yeah, 120. I would be like, ooh, I would, you, you should not have thrown away right. your CDs. <laughs> yeah. But the 320, I'm like, ah, to you're me, not going to hear the difference. <laughs> I, I would, it's not objectively lossless, but I would call it subjectively yeah. lossless. I have yeah, never yeah. in any blind comparison been able to tell 320 kilobit AAC or MP3 apart from the original lossless track. I've never been able to do it once. Um, so yeah. then we go back to why are you hearing you know some differences you know here or there with titles in particular now spotify uh, free spotify right. the free That's tier like, maxes out at 160 uh and most of the time it's 96 I thought, yeah, I thought yeah. it was 96. So <laughs> most of the time it's 96. Yeah. I'm like, there, there, that's lossy enough that I would genuinely yeah. think think you actually should, if you're critically listening, be able to tell the difference between Spotify free and Tidal. Now, Tidal, uh, he's doing the Tidal Hi-Fi. That is the lossless. Now, when you say lossless, that is not the same as what is called high-res audio. High-res right. audio refers to a higher bit depth and sampling rate than CD quality. CD quality is 16 bits, 44.1 kilohertz sampling. Now, if it's 24 bits and 48 kilohertz sampling, which is what's on all of our Blu-ray discs or Ultra HD Blu-ray discs, then it would technically be technically be considered high-res audio. A lot of times it's 24-bit, 96 kilohertz, or even 192 kilohertz. Now, all of that stuff is basically baloney. Um, yeah. However, I always come back to the thing of uh, what the bit depth and the sampling rate, anything above 16-bit 44.1 kilohertz, it's just a bigger container uh, that is capable of holding more than a human can hear. 16 bits 44.1 kilohertz is a bit container just big enough to hold everything that you can hear. But... Uh, what is put into those containers is up to the people making the recordings. And if you uh, just anecdotally find that they tend to put the better sounding uh, masters into the bigger container, it's not that the smaller container physically couldn't hold it. But if that's what they always right. choose to do, then it's like, yeah, I don't have a problem with choosing the bigger container because most of the time that's where they're opting to put the better sounding master, not because it's the only physical way to do it, but because they're just choosing to do so. Um, so, but title basically has nothing to do with high res audio. It is CD quality audio, but lossless. It is not 
an MP3 or an AAC where some data is objectively thrown away, it is losslessly encoded. Uh, what goes in is exactly what comes back out, but at CD quality. So that versus Spotify free, I'm like, yeah, you probably probably should, can and should hear a difference. Apple Music, it's 256 kilobit AAC. I'm like, I would struggle to hear any difference there. So the difference with Tidal is that they do tend to work directly with the studios and artists to get original masters that they encode themselves. Uh, right. there, there is a difference going on there with Tidal. So it's not just that the containers are different because the containers don't really make a difference. It's that what's being put into those containers are different masters most of the times. It's Tidal doing the encoding themselves uh, from the original master track. So maybe they're sweetening things a little bit I don't really know. But subjectively, if you like it most of the time, better than the other versions, who really cares? <laughs> that's, right. that's worth it. And that so many times, and I, I always go back to that uh, stupid uh, rock band version yeah, of the Metallica right. yeah. album, you know, that we, we talk about. And uh, the, the version that came out on CD was more highly compressed dynamic range compression than what was in the rock in band the video version game of it. I mean, version. it was a yep. the video game version of that album was better quality, yeah. not because of anything else. It all came from the same master. And the video game version was like objectively the data was compressed to hell. Like they, <laughs> there was a whole right. bunch of data right. thrown away. It was really shrunk down in file size. It was lossy compression, but they chose not to get rid of all the dynamics in it. And therefore subjectively, it sounded way better than the CD. <laughs> yeah. So when we, whenever somebody comes to me and says, I did some tests between two different, you know, things right. and I heard or did not hear a difference, you know, I, 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 I it always goes back to the mix yeah. and who did the compression, who did the mixing, why, where could that have made the difference? Because like Rob said, the containers don't make mm -hmm. the difference. You know, I've, I don't know how many times I've had people argue with me about, uh, you know, you know, soda or beer, whether or not glass or aluminum makes it. I'm like, I've never, I've never been able to taste the difference between the two of them. Like the container somehow made the change, and those are physically different mm -hmm. containers. In this case, we're just talking about digital, mm -hmm. and it it really makes no difference. So if there, you're hearing a difference, you already accounted for one of the main biases that we would have suggested, which was loudness. Sure. You tried to account for that as best you can. It's very hard to do, but you tried to account for that as best you can. But in this case, it's almost certainly because Tidal is doing something themselves that nobody else is doing, and that's why we're hearing you're hearing a difference. And just because you had it on CD doesn't mean that the best mix got on Definitely that CD. Not. Effects, yeah. you know, the, you know, the, the least compressed dynamic range, the least comp compressed got on there because they definitely it, it, that's not always the case. Uh, he says, Tidal Hi-Fi also says it offers master quality authenticated audio, the MQA, mm -hmm. which comes from Meridian, if I remember yeah, correctly. Is that, a, is that a real worthwhile thing, or is that getting into the realm of esoteric speaker wires and psychoacoustic psycho nonsense? Uh, it's supposed to be <laughs> remixed in, you know, auth you know basically... Uh, there's supposed to be some sort of overview of the music to make sure that when it's encoded, it's, you know, it's encoded correctly and it has, you know, the, the, all the dynamic range it's supposed to and everything else there immediately when that came out, we started hearing reports of them, the, the, the CD version and the MQA version sounding identical so then you start to say, okay, well, do they really do anything or do they just re-encode it? You know? I mean, technically, uh, there there actually is a thing called an MQA decoder because the idea is that it is right. a CD file with additional metadata that is supposed to restore all the things that were lost when it was downmixed from 24192 or 2496 down to CD quality and the metadata is supposed to restore all that. It had nothing to do with that. It's that the person who mastered the thing listened to their original, listened to this compressed version and said, yep, those sound the same to me. I give it my seal of approval. But the whole process ended up being kind of automated, whether the original mastering people were actually brought in to do that. Nah, not really. Uh, so it, in... In effect, in practice, it's really kind of a worthless thing. Um, 
I, I would not worry one iota about whether a track is MQA or not. That is right. not important. No. <laughs> and practice. I've already I, I've already been on podcasts with people. It's been it's been a while, but somebody started talking about that stuff, and I was like, you know, it's it's nothing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All the MQA stuff is just so much better than everything else. I'm like, well, I don't think that's objectively true. <laughs> <laughs> pretty, pretty sure that's just that's just not true. All right. Overall, which premium streaming music membership do we think is the most worthwhile? Spotify Premium is supposed to offer 320 files, same as Tidal Premium, but Tidal High File, which is more expensive, offers lossless MQA and Atmos music. He's already sort of ruled out Apple Music. He isn't a big fan of their interface and service overall, and they only claim to deliver 256. <laughs> so what do we think? Uh, well, isn't uh, who's doing? That? I thought didn't we say that that weird speaker from Amazon was doing the the Atmos music is the only way you could get it? So but the are they doing something better? The Echo Studio is presently the only way to get Atmos music from Amazon Music HD. Uh, now, Amazon Music HD is a service that I kind of get behind because the price is lower than Tidal, uh, but they are still offering lossless, 60 million tracks, and they do have Atmos Music. It's just at the moment that we're recording this, at the end of October 2020, the only way to listen to that Atmos Music on Amazon Music HD is via their own Echo Studio speaker, which is a stupid way to listen to Atmos Music. Uh, but we are <laughs> assuming that at some point they will allow it to be played through a Fire TV device, an Amazon Fire TV device played through your home AV receiver that does Atmos decoding. We're assuming that will come at some point, at which point Amazon Music HD will, I think, be almost kind of the runaway winner if you're into it at all. Right now, if you want to listen to Atmos Music on a full Atmos sound system and not just a dinky little smart speaker, uh, then Tidal's the only game in town. And he already said he's really enjoying Atmos music. So for the time being, right. I would say stick with Tidal Hi-Fi, even though it's $20 a month. If you're really enjoying Atmos music, you know that the quality is there. It is lossless, so you're not worrying about compression or something like that. The MQA, we said, don't worry about that. But hey, it's there. Whatever. No big deal. Uh, but mostly the Atmos music. If that's what you want to listen to, right now, Tidal's the only game in town. Once Amazon Music HD opens it up, I would strongly consider switching there simply because the price is lower. Mm, there we go. So is there a better software solution for handling his locally stored music files and uh, playing them back via his NVIDIA Shield? Plex is fine, but if there's another app that's more capable and faster to navigate, he'd like to give it a try. So not my question. Yeah, so this is Android TV that we have to look at. Um, there's only a couple that I'm f at all familiar. I don't use them, but uh, at least I've peeked at them. And these ones come recommended by other people. So that's Media Monkey, which I think is probably the one that you want to try the most. Uh, Media Monkey has, you know, brings in metadata, gives you a nice looking interface, and it's easier to navigate around than Plex is for music specifically. Uh, so Media Monkey look at, the other one is AIMP. AIMP is like a really stripped down music player. If you just want the bare bones, here's my list of tracks, play it for me. Uh, then AIMP might be the way you want to go. All right, Infinite Gary. I mentioned that I had argued with Gene from Audioholics about calling the center speaker the most important speaker in the surround sound setup. Gary understands why I argue that it is actually the least important speaker, but out of curiosity, what were Gene's arguments? The same arguments everybody else has. You know, that's where the voices come from. It centers everything on the, on the screen. If people sit off center, then suddenly your phantom center breaks down and... I still think he's wrong. So. <laughs> and a lot of the soundtrack, think... a lot of important stuff in the soundtrack comes from the center channel. And that is that right. is true. That's just an objective fact. That's true. So as we've mentioned before, where we're in agreement is if you do have a physical center speaker playing that center channel, it should be a good speaker and it should timbre match your front left and right so that when things pan across the front, it sounds like a homogenous sound panning across the front. So if you do have a center, it should be a good one. But Tom and I agree that it is, in fact, the least important speaker in a surround sound setup because you can remove it without removing any sounds. And the sounds will still okay. all play and from the location that they should play from, even with the physical speaker not being there. I mean, it's the least important speaker in a 5.1 setup, I sure. guess, because, yeah, you know, you could say that, you know, the surround backs, all that stuff gets wiped into the or spread into the surrounds as well it doesn't go but away but then it isn't truly uh, coming from exactly the location that it should have that's yeah. right that is true 
Nick. Nick picked up a Neo Geo Arcade Stick Pro. It isn't just an arcade stick. The whole thing is a retro gaming system with the Neo Geo library built in. But that means if you want to sit on your couch with the arcade stick on your lap or on the table in front of you, you need long cables in order to plug it in. <laughs> Not the greatest design. The Mexican sent out the 720p, so it's so pretty much any long HDMI cable should be okay, correct? Yeah. Uh, I would think even so. Even standard we'll speed the... HDMI, not even yeah. high speed HDMI is necessary. High speed HDMI you want for 1080p and above, uh, but you're talking 720p, which is the actually a little bit lower bandwidth than 1080i, right? The original high definition, and that is what standard speed HDMI could handle. So yeah. Any HDMI cable will be okay with 720p. <laughs> so the power input for the arcade stick is a USB-C port, and the, the included USB-C to USB-A power cord is pretty short. He needs 20 feet. He looked around the model price, and strangely, they don't have any USB-C to USB-A cables longer than 4 meters. So can we point him to a cable that would work for this? There's got to be an extender out there that just for the USB-A I would it, point right? you to an extender, yeah. Uh, strangely, it is a bit difficult to find 20-foot-long uh, USB-C to USB-A cables. <laughs> they just don't really seem to exist around that much. Uh, but 20-foot USB-A to USB-A USB-A, uh, USB 3.0 bandwidth cables, which are fully capable of putting whatever amount of power you need to in there. Uh, 14 bucks can get you a 20 foot one of those right off of Amazon. Uh, so that's what I would do. I just get an extender and uh, plug the end into the included power cable that came and uh, that that'll do the trick. There you go. Jeff. Jeff has an LG C8 OLED. He's using it with an Apple TV 4K. If he is watching something that is in Dolby Vision, he's getting the raised blacks issues. Raised blacks, dude. Why got to make it about race? It is not. Issue where where the black bars are not totally black and fully black images are dark mm. gray. Google searches have turned up plenty of other people also describing this issue. Do we have any experience with it? Is there a fix? I feel like we just talked about this recently. Is this a backlight thing or a no. no no it's a it's a it's a the rgb yeah this is a decoding y, yc yc not yc yc not being thing, done yeah. correctly thing so uh for the c8 specifically so this was all the lg letter and then eight series that came out in 2018 uh this was a known issue uh you are not imagining it there was a firmware update that was released that largely fix this issue uh, but whether or not that actually was ever received on your television is a question mark I would encourage right. you to get in touch with LG tech support and make absolutely sure you have the very latest firmware that is available for your C8 they might even just email you a link to download onto a USB thumb drive and have you update the firmware that way you also need to make sure that the firmware on your Apple TV 4k is fully updated because it also had to be firmware updated for the whole Old Dolby Vision system to work together, but even if you do both of those things, people still occasionally have this problem where the black bars are dark gray, something that's supposed to be a fully black image is dark gray, and basically all you can do is, while that video is playing, you go into the Apple TV 4K's picture settings, you toggle Dolby Vision off, and you toggle Dolby Vision back on, and that seems to fix the issue. <laughs> so Yay. it's uh, less than elegant. Uh, we wish there didn't have to be any type of manual futzing about with it, but it it does work, uh, but you're not imagining that those raised blacks exist. Uh, it's not your fault. It was a known issue. And even if you have the most up-to-date firmware sometimes, while the video's playing, you have to toggle Dolby Vision off and then back on again in your Apple TV 4K. Robert. Robert's looking to get an ultra short throw projector and he's debating whether to get the Epson LS500 for six grand or Samsung's the premier LSP9T for 6,500. Mm. I just want to say, Samsung's putting, putting together a heck of a lineup for WWE wrestling next year. Epson claims their three LCD panel technology plus laser light engine can deliver superior colors versus DLP, but Samsung claims their triple laser light engine can deliver better colors. So they're both the same, same well they're not the same, the same. thing there, there are differences i know but they're saying the they same they are thing. claiming yeah so which one should he get i'm getting the six thousand dollar one because i want to save 500 well bucks. not only that uh there's a bigger price difference going on here than you might anticipate because the epson ls 500 at its six thousand dollar price point includes a 120 inch ultra short throw screen uh whereas the samsung lsp 9t at sixty five hundred dollars is just the projector 
and you still need to buy your own screen, which is going to cost, like we've been talking about, at least $1,500, possibly as much as $3,500 if you want the very best that are out there and available. Uh, so the difference in price here is larger than just $500 difference because there's an entire screen to consider. That said... Uh, I haven't seen the Samsung The Premier LSP90 in person, but going by Mark Henninger's review over at uh, AVS Forum and just looking at the technology that's involved, the LSP90 is the superior projector to the uh, Epson LS500. There's really no question about it. Having red, green, and blue lasers delivering the light source is, we haven't had that in any projector at this type of price point before. It can reach the entire Rec 2020 color gamut. There is no other consumer display that can do that. Um, so the Epson, while it is using a laser as its light source, it's a blue laser, uh, plus a blue laser shining through a yellow phosphor to create white light which is then divided through a prism into red green and blue like all of our regular white lamps are uh, and put onto lcd panels the epson ls500 has lower inherent contrast than the samsung it has not as wide color when they're saying it's better color than most other dlps yep that's true most other dlps are a white lamp going through a spinning color wheel but that is not the case with the LSP90. The LSP90 is a red laser, a green laser, and a blue laser. Basically unique, and it is the superior projector. But once you add a screen to it, whereas a screen was coming with the Epson, you got like a $3,000 price difference you're looking at. So right. uh, yeah, you'll have to decide there. But the Samsung is the better one. What's up? Okay, Dennis, okay. <laughs> I'm just trying. I know, I know, we're going over, but well, there, uh, when, yeah, we have 20 we, questions on the list, but that's uh, good. Anything we that, can do. These are these are short questions at the end, so I'm trying to get through a couple of them real quick. Dennis has a Samsung Q7 QLED TV, and he just discovered that it does not have eARC. Mm -hmm. He recently purchased a Marantz SR6014 and wants to use it with his Nvidia Shield Pro. He wants to make sure he can hear lossless audio. So, what's the best way to proceed? Uh, I guess he's trying to use the apps in there. Is that the 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 problem because if everything's going through the Marantz then lossless audio won't be a problem exactly yeah I mean as uh, long as you are physically able to plug the NVIDIA Shield Pro into the Marantz instead of into the Samsung right. then I, which I can't imagine that the TV is in between the receiver and the NVIDIA Pro right. I mean, I mean, the, the NVIDIA Shield Pro is quite a small device. So even if it has to just yeah. like live on top of the AV receiver, it, it should be physically possible to move it. Because the, yeah. the Marantz SR6014 can pass through all the video that the NVIDIA Shield Pro is capable of outputting. So there will be no downgrading of the video as you connect the Shield to the Marantz and then connect the Marantz to the Samsung. So there's no need to use eARC for the Shield. You don't have to plug the Shield right. into the Samsung and then use eARC to get the audio back to the Marantz. No, it's, the Shield should right. go into the Marantz. And then, of course, with the Shield connected to the Marantz, Whatever audio is coming out of the NVIDIA Shield is decoded by the Marantz, uh, including full lossless audio if you're playing back, like, let's say, uh, backed up Blu-rays or backed up Ultra HD Blu-rays via Plex or Kodi or even the VLC video player, uh, right. which can do it. So that is what you want to do now. Like, you know, he didn't have a receiver before, so obviously he had the shield plugged into his Samsung QLED before, and maybe he's just like, oh, it's already nicely set up. I don't want to have to change any cables or move anything, but... The Shield Pro is a small device. If you have to move it, move it, plug it into the Marantz, and then everything is as good as it can possibly be. Bob's your uncle. Last, Xavier. Uh, no, Javier. Javier. Yeah. Time is it? 11.30 p.m. All right. Javier. Javier says that he is new to home, all this home theater stuff, but he has jumped in whole hog with a Denon X4700H receiver. He has read how it can power 5.2.4 speaker setup all by mm -hmm. itself in order to have a 7.2.4 setup, which would be sweet. He needs a power amp. Yep. Could he use a Yamaha receiver as that power yes. amp? Is he correct in thinking that he he would use the pre-outs from the Denon and connect those to the aux input on the Yamaha, then plug one pair of speakers in the Yamaha and all the other speakers into the Denon. Is there anything more to it? Uh, yes, there's a little bit more to it, but not much because you are pretty much yep. right on it. Unless they have pre-ins 
<laughs> on the Yamaha. He mentioned the receiver model, and it does not. So it's got, okay. you know, it's got, uh, as you would expect on most of your receivers, uh, more than one pair of analog red, white RCA yeah. inputs. Yeah. Any you literally just have to pick one. <laughs> Except for phono. It doesn't matter. Don't put it in the phono because yeah. the, the level phono. will be wrong. But like the CD input or the you know yeah. VCR1 input, whatever it is, uh, the red and white, yeah. um, that, that's what you plug into. As far as the other which th- pre-outs yeah, to ahead. use from the Denon, um, you'll only have two choices. If you tell it right. that you have an 11 speaker setup, uh, one of the settings in the Denon will then be pre-outs. And you will only have two choices, front, left, and right, or um, whatever your rear most at most speakers are. So like if you have top right. rears, it'll be top rears. If you have rear heights, it'll be rear heights. If you have uh, Dolby enabled rear speakers, it'll be those. Whatever your rear most at most speakers are, they will be the second option. Um, yeah. So honestly- and You want to set your uh, Yamaha to a volume level yeah. that you will never change again and hopefully reference. So if it's- got the relative you know the negative whatever whatever up to mm-hmm. zero you want to set it to zero and then take the knob <laughs> off and super glue yeah. that super glue the the volume the volume pot so that it doesn't ever move well you don't have to do that you just have to make sure that it never yeah. you just have to make again. sure that the the volume dial uh the volume setting the master volume setting on your yamaha receiver never gets touched uh also i mean on the yamaha receiver i would just yeah. uh do a full factory reset because I don't yeah. want any weird trim levels. If somebody ran right. EQ on it before, you don't want that applied. You just want the Yamaha. You don't need that that Yamaha to do nothing. anything. So <laughs> factory reset or put it into pure direct yeah. mode or yeah. whatever it takes to to just take away all the all the yeah. settings. You're like, well, what about the distance? Like, yeah, don't worry. The Denon's That's doing right. that. That's right. Denon can do all of that. All you want that thing to do is to power the yeah. speakers. So it's a very big power amp with a lot of extra <laughs> features that you don't need, but... That's all you can, do. Set the volume knob to zero. Make sure you have it the right input. And then, you know, clear out all the settings so that it doesn't have any trim, any anything that's in there. Right. Factory reset, uh, direct, pure direct mode, and then don't touch it don't ever touch again. Don't touch the volume ever again. Um, and honestly, I mean, with a Yamaha receiver, uh, it, it wouldn't be unreasonable to say, yeah, the, the speakers in my 11 speaker setup that are going to be powered by the external amp, in this case, a Yamaha receiver, are my front left and rights. That's perfectly reasonable sure. to do. Uh, that'll take uh, more of a load off of your Denon uh, so that it can power the other nine speakers a little bit more easily because a lot of content is in the front left right speakers. Plus, it's very easy to picture, okay, the front left and right pre-outs from my Denon, they go into the CD input of my Yamaha, and then I plug my front left and right speakers into the front left and right speaker binding posts of my Yamaha now, right? So it, it right. keeps it all very easy to uh, keep track of, and it's perfectly reasonable to power your front left and right speakers with that Yamaha. And yeah, totally can work as an external okay. amp. All right, who do we have we left? We have RD, Marcus F, Aaron M, Rob X, and Jason S. That is everybody on the list. None of those are tremendously long, although I don't know how long the answers might be. And uh, yeah, right. things did roll in on Monday and Tuesday, of course. They will be on the list for next week. We'll hit whatever Rob we're able X. to. What is he, an X-Men? Rob uh, X. I'm supposed to believe his last name really starts with X. What's his last name? X-Ray? It could be Xavier. <laughs> it's not impossible. Uh, Xavier starts with a J. Shut up. <laughs> All right. This is AV Rant, the podcast that answers your home theater and AV questions. To get your questions answered, all you have to do is ask. You ask by emailing us at question at avrant.com. That's right. We want to thank our listeners of the week. We want to thank Brandon for going to AV Rant and clicking on the Buy Us a Cup of Coffee link and giving us a PayPal donation, as well as our 123 patrons over at patreon.com, including Kevin. For sure. Brandon, so. thank you so much for the PayPal donation. Uh, patreon.com slash avrant podcast for anybody who'd like to sign up for an automatic monthly donation. Big thanks to our 123 patrons over there. Kevin, thank you for being one of them. And we also thank uh, some listeners for their notes of gratitude for keeping the podcast going during these trying times, including Kevin, Daz, Mark, Dan, Jack, Zakir, Nathan, and Jason. So thank you, gentlemen. That is right. I'll just repeat the names real quick. Kevin, Daz, Mark, Dan. Jack, Zakir, Nathan, and Jason. Really do appreciate those notes of gratitude and encouragement. And uh, yeah, big thanks to everybody for continuing to listen, for continuing to send in your questions. Question at avrant.com. That's the way to get on the podcast. And uh, yeah, it's been fun. Thank you very much. 
For AV Rant, I'm Tom Mandry. And I'm Rob H. Now stay in and listen to something. Want your question answered? Send it to question at avrant.com. AV Rant. Now go out and listen to something.